welcome AI community with no borders. Please share with us in the chat where you are joining us from. First and foremost, dear all, before I kick off our virtual, I want to say a huge thank you to our awesome AI community. You guys are really incredible. We are thrilled to share with you that in the last event, we passed that 4,000 mark of participants from almost 100 countries. This is just amazing. I love you guys. We are not taking it for granted that you invest your valuable time, and we do very much appreciate having you listening to what our impressive AI thought leaders and experts have to share. We are welcoming you to exchange with all of us in the chat, connect on social media, and establish new cognitive relations around the globe. This is exactly what the Swiss cognitive community is aiming for. Committed to advancing AI for society and business. At our last cognitive virtual in October, we connected the dots in the world of AI, not only across industries and organizations, but also across continents. And in fact, all seven of them. This time, we dive into practical insights on where we stand when it comes to empowering our machines and processes with AI and other cognitive technologies. What are the success factors and what are the pitfalls? The last one to two years showed us clearly applying rule-based automation alone is not enough. Processes need to be infused with learning-based intelligence, both human and artificial, leading to autonomy of algorithms. But what stands in the way? How far can we go? How do we ensure that we trust human AI collaboration? What needs to happen in the terms of regulation that fosters trust but doesn't hinder innovation? Many questions to be covered today by three keynotes, three panels, and one discussion and interview. So my dear audience without borders, please use the chat for Q&A and connect with each other. Make some great posts on social media and don't forget to mention the speakers and Swiss Cognitive in your post. Use the hashtag Cognitive Virtual. And now it's time that we dive into agenda, which we are going to start with an opening interview with my inspiring friend, Alexandra. I remember four years ago when we first met in one of the very little Swiss valet, actually on the height of 14,000 K, discussing AI, as a game changer in very small church with 35 participants. That was a very, very special occasion. And today, our topic is automation, human-machine collaboration, autonomy, how do we find the limits? So, Alexandra, it's my honor to have you here with us today. Let me introduce you quickly to our global audience. Alexandra, you habilitated from management and hold a PhD in philosophy of AI. You have conducted research at the Center of Collective Intelligence at the MIT in Boston, and you have graduated from the New School for Social Research in New York. You're currently Associated Professor at the Department of Management in Digital and Network Societies and the leader of the AI in Management Program at the Komlinski University. You're interested in the development of new technologies, natural language processing, humanoid artificial intelligence, social robots, and variable technologies. You're also the author of Collaborative Society. Alexandra, we highly appreciate that you are here today sharing your broad knowledge around AI. Now, first and foremost, Alexandra, please share with our community how did you fell in love with AI? I just love this story. <laughs> Thank you so much, Delise. Um, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, indeed, I'm always happy to, to present here at the Swiss Cognitive. It's a very valuable initiative. I think that um, uh, creates bridges for many different AI specialties. AI is this big umbrella term, so there are many of us, so I'm, I'm uh, very much appreciative of the fact that I'm here. Um, in fact, it is true that my story is not a simple one. It didn't start with vivid interest in programming in high school and then, uh, you know, landing in a computer science program. Quite to the contrary, um, I have always uh, developed interest in, in humanities, although there was a breach from that. Uh, I think in high school I had a special interest in biology for a year and, or two maybe. And then I did move to, to humanities and I 
pursued first uh, studies in um, uh, journalism and communication, if you will. And during those studies, it turned out that communication aspects and uh, theories around emerging technologies and how they're reshaping society are, are more interesting to me than the journalism workshop per se. So kind of I did my bachelor and abandoned that. And I started studying philosophy. And uh, during my philosophy studies, I encountered a, a fairly incredible uh, human being, a professor, uh, uh, Sierowski, his name was, I still remember, who was uh, a polytechnic school uh, professor in, in Breslau, Wrocław, Poland. And he uh, delivered a course uh, for human um, kind of uh, for human studies students about artificial intelligence so it was kind of AI for philosophers and um, that's something that really triggered my interest and during the philosophy studies I also noticed that I was more inclined towards you know logics and semiotics and I think from logics and semiotics and formal operations on language actually the pathway towards programming is not so long so I started programming at that time and learning first Lisp was my first language for some reason, uh, then Python. And uh, already when I finished those studies, I was um, kind of more certain that I want to take the path of merging practice in uh, AI with uh, theoretical concerns and reflections about artificial intelligence. And so my PhD was devoted essentially to the Turing test, the possibility of passing the Turing test which is both a great philosophical question and something that you can engage in uh, as a practical experience because you can design a bot and see how well it does. And that's kind of how it all kicked in. And uh, ever since, uh, for the past 10 years, I've been very much engaged in the um, community in machine learning, natural language processing, and that's kind of how it goes. Thanks a lot, Alexandra. This is exactly what I love with your story. I mean, combining philosophy and AI these are definitely two things that go along together very well. The European approach to artificial intelligence will help build a resilient Europe for the digital decade where people and business can enjoy the benefits of AI. It focuses actually on two areas, excellence in AI and trustworthy AI. The European approach to AI will ensure that any AI improvements are based on rules that safeguard the functioning of markets and the public sector and people's safety and fundamental rights. So now if we're thinking about building AI, we need also to think of all these many different sensors who can exchange information and retrieve information about the world of then passes into an AI system that can adapt and react to what is really happening in the world right now. You're currently focusing on the regularities coming along with such developments. Alexandra, where do you see the biggest challenges starting of the facts, where centers are placed, what they are tracking, what data they are using and producing before actually being fed into an AI system? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is a great question. And I think there are many levels, I would say, of answers to that question. One is uh, related to best practices, really, in the data scientific community, related to data cleaning, to data quality, uh, data internal representation of a phenomenon that that data is supposed to represent. So there, uh, I guess, certain benchmarks of um, a behavior that allows you to build both resilient systems that process uh, real-time data and those that actually deliver information that is meaningful and non-biased as well, which touches upon the ethics. So I do think that, you know, that's one big part of uh, the whole question. How do we make sure that the data that we're getting from sensors is reliable, is accurate, and is representative? And that's kind of number one, I think, something that needs to happen before you feed it into AI. You need to make sure that that data quality is out there. And I know this is a topic that you've been underlining here um, at the events quite often, that you know, AI is kind of this final step, but before that, there's so much going on. And I have to tell you that, for instance, uh, in our program in management and artificial intelligence at Kosminski uh, in Warsaw, uh, we're teaching uh, data ethics to our students, uh, which is very practical as a course, because we're just looking at different data sets and what they lack and how they could be enhanced. Um, quite often, these are historical data sets, but 
recently more so even sensor data coming from simple sources, you know, uh, even, uh, you know, movement location data, that's still something that you can look at from the perspective of accuracy for sure. And uh, I do think that this component is very, very important in the sense that um, building a resilient AI community means building a community that is responsible for the processes and tries its best to uh, really create data sets that uh, they can trust. And then that, you know, obviously will lead hopefully to systems that if they make decisions about uh, human um, activities or the very existence, when you think about medical data, for instance, and remote sensors, wearable technologies of that kind, well, that you uh, know that you uh, are creating uh, a tr trustworthy solution, like you said, that kind of goes back to uh, the framework proposed that by the European Commission these days, right, about r regulating essentially the sphere of AI. But I think it really boils down, apart from regulations that we will probably talk about, I think it boils down to also certain attitudes and nurturing um, responsible approach. Uh, when you are an AI specialist, an ML specialist, clearly you're not just a domain expert. You are a person that uh, is designing something that will impact human life. And this is something that has to be understood at every step of the way. That, that's the way I view it also, you know, ethically, philosophically, kind of. Before now this interview, and we were also discussing about exactly what you're saying at the end, the human being being the plus one sensor. It needs a human being to look at the data, at the results. It's an iterative process. And listening to what you just said, I would like to elaborate a little bit more on how to guide implementation and how can we perhaps provide a self-assessment guide for both sides, the implementation guys as well as on the business side. Well, I think this is uh, this requires uh, a large degree of co collaboration, at least to me, and uh, a certain shared understanding and uh, sense making. To me, that's kind of number one. Um, recently, I've been more on the business side, and um, I've, we've been consulting as an academic team with various uh, sectors. And uh, it felt like, you know, uh, the first thing that we have to set up is being on the same page as far as the process is concerned. We are supposed to deliver something, but we are also the ones who are at the beginning very much responsible for certain diligence checks. Do we have everything we need for that process, right? What is exactly the question that the business would like to ask? Usually we need to help in formulating that question to make it as precise or precise enough for AI to be able to answer that question in any way that is meaningful. And I think on both sides, there's also one more thing that I would say that is very important, and that's uh, the sort of understanding uh, that uh, artificial intelligence research or ML research is truly a research, which means it requires iteration. It will not always succeed at the very first uh, time when you implement it. You will need uh, that uh, cycle um, and very often you will need to come back to where you were before in order to, well, perhaps reformulate something or um, create a new hypothesis, a supportive hypothesis. And I do feel that on the business side, for instance, sometimes these understanding that this is a scientific discovery per se may be missing. And that this is something where we need to kind of find ourselves in the same space, sort of, that we are talking here about a process that it is essentially a discovery. And thus, the results are often unknown at the beginning. You cannot just expect that if we are supposed to, let's say, establish a predictive model uh, that will allow for a more granular income prediction, that it's going to happen right away if we just set up a deadline of two months, because we are talking about the research project. So that to me is also a very important, uh, I think, step on the way when you think about uh, technology versus business. I, I would like to step into one keyword. For me, a keyword is what you mentioned, to discover. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the things that people should know while you, you want to discover something. Obviously, you are coming up perhaps with other results that you expected on. And this iterative process is a very important one. And I think this is also something that, as you mentioned, we're keeping on saying, hey, we have to learn. It's an interaction between human and machines. It's a very important interaction to make sure that we're leading to 
the benefit of humanity at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. this leads me to the book that you wrote about collaborative society, looking mm -hmm. at the future of humanity. What skills then do we humans need in a future where intelligent machines can take over more and more of our tasks? You did some mm -hmm. research on collaborative yeah. AI with the Howard University. Please share with us some of the results of the studies and especially how productivity increased. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I, I think it touches uh, really in many ways uh, um, upon the topics that you are discussing or we are all discussing here uh, during the event, autonomy, autonomousness versus uh, let's say support uh, and i think we are standing in front of this very big question how normatively speaking we want to view artificial intelligence is ai uh, a tool that assists in decision making or is it truly or will it be a decision maker and i think this is a very valid question and there's no way to omit that question and we have to start answering uh, this question because technologically speaking i believe that in many areas we could design systems that can work, uh, well, to a large extent, autonomously as decision makers. But do we want this is a big question. So we, um, uh, our team at Kosminski, in collaboration with, with Harvard, but also with MIT previously, uh, we've conducted various studies where we mostly focused on AI as a, a support, as an extension of our brain that helps us out in particular decisions. And we've uh, designed a study now a pilot project, but we are scaling it, uh, where we've uh, spoken um, to marketers, uh, managers, but me mainly really marketers, and we've asked them, you know, how would you like your work to be automated? Your work is a set of many different tasks. Some of them are easy to automate, some of them are harder to automate, but like, um, at the final point, the interesting question is, which one would you like? Which task would you like to be automated? Because essentially we want to know what uh, alleviates and what helps in your work. Um, if you want AI that's going to brainstorm stuff with you, we can probably establish a tool that could be helpful in that. If you want just an assistant that's going to set up meetings, that's fine. If you want a system that will budget a campaign or track your competitors, I guess even today with transformers, we could try and build uh, algorithmic systems that would be able to do that. And so in our pilot project, we have uh, invested like in a study where one group of marketers was working on their own uh, on tasks that they know, drafting an advertising campaign, whereas the other group was working with um, a transformers based kind of system that we've designed for them. And uh, they were choosing where they want tasks to be automated. and. Uh, that group has worked uh, much more effectively. So their productivity actually reached uh, a peak, I think, because it surpassed the uh, productivity of the other group by 57%. And also what is even more interesting, because you're talking about human machine collaboration, uh, the, the aspect of collaboration is important here too, and the flow of collaboration and how you feel about that process and whether that works for you, especially if you're not a pure geek, but a person who wants to use this technology as a newcomer, not necessarily someone who has studied, uh, I don't know, data science for three years, and you don't have time for that because you're doing something else in your work. So then a simple conversational system that can be internally very complex, but on the external part is very friendly, is something that you will probably enjoy using. And uh, in our study, what was very interesting was that uh, the people who have worked with the system were more satisfied with their work. The satisfaction rate reached uh, again, a peak and surpassed the other group by 68%, which means that these people still own their work. They felt that they have worked on that and they got the support that they needed and they were able to choose which type of support they want. So it was not a top-down approach where technology gets imposed on you. And I think if we talk about AI as a mainstream future, as a general purpose technology that really will penetrate many spheres of our lives, uh, many sectors of our work, logistics, transportation, I don't know, retail, um, healthcare, uh, then truly uh, we have to focus on tools that people who are non-geeks will not reject. And this study was kind of about that. I would love to share those results with our community if we can. So yeah, that sure. would be very interesting. And I think it's exactly what you're saying. It's not only for 
tech people. At the end of the day, AI is an underlying, is a technology that is here to be used. And the business side needs to understand the power of AI, but not necessarily needs to be able to implement it. What I'm really wondering is, we were talking about, so you ask them what they want to be replaced, where they want to be supported, repetitive mm -hmm. tasks or other, mm. uh, other activities. What tools are you working on which should not be autonomous? Did you, did you figure out mm -hmm. some of those? Oh, that's a, that's a great question, I think. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, even the part that you mentioned about uh, routines versus non-routines is not clear. Because there are many people who love routines and uh, they want to keep them. So in our study, that already was a challenge that you see many different people with many different needs. But frankly speaking, um, I think we reached certain unity among our study participants when it comes to the tasks of working with other people. So strategizing um, was one thing that most of them wanted to keep. So like certain oversight and greater vision for the project, setting up goals. But the other thing we have noticed uh, that is obviously immensely hard to uh, algorithmize, sort of like to, you know, to create as, as a task force AI systems was um, oversight um, uh, concerning other people's work, mentoring other people, teaching other people. It turned out that people really, particularly in senior positions, love it, enjoy it and want to keep it and also believe that for AI it would be very hard to do. Uh, they said that they wanted to learn from AI certain things, but generally oversight um, as they perceived it, like, um, and also building someone else's career through guiding them was something that they wanted to keep for themselves. And that was something that they felt uh, should not be left to AI by any means, uh, should be remaining by the human side and also uh, perhaps won't ever be done uh, or not in any foreseeable future because, well, AI is essentially not designed for that. So they really most often, uh, even when you think about jobs and tasks, when you think about advertising campaign and even such a small part of it that would be related to, let's say, um, uh, organizing a meeting. Organizing a meeting is also a multi-step thing to do. And usually they would pick just few of these little sub-steps to be automated and not the whole task per se. So really it felt like uh, the approach where AI is the co-decision maker, but in very insular aspects was the, um, you know, uh, part that they enjoyed most. And uh, they wanted to keep the oversight of the whole process and the human part definitely uh, for themselves. Great, thanks. I think this shows again, what is really important is this interpersonal relationship that we have and that a lot of time we're not talking about whole jobs that we are going to lose. It's more about certain tasks. And I think it's up to us to really negotiate to see what do we want to keep and what not. Now, time is running. I have quite some questions from the audience. I would like to share one with you. Very short answer. And the other question, my dear audience, please raise it up in LinkedIn directly to Alexandra and she will be an answer. In, on LinkedIn, so the whole audience can benefit yeah. from it. I'm so sorry that the time is so short, but one question, I actually have so many, Alexandra, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just gonna pick up the first one. How do you suggest that we could test AI? Very short, mm -hmm. it's a very difficult question. Oh my gosh, uh, from what perspective, you know, setting up which ki what kinds of benchmarks I can, Think about, uh, for instance, this whole framework that we're going to discuss in the panel of trustworthy artificial intelligence. And then you have criteria such as interpretability, accuracy, but also transparency, um, uh, privacy or control, right? So these are the parameters of assessment of AI that is a trustworthy system. Uh, now you can approach it obviously from a completely different perspective and say how advanced is AI and here you will have to probably look at its behavior, at its uh, learning curve, and also at its capability of being transferred elsewhere to work with a different task. And then you will see the strength of a network. Let's say if that's a network that is well trained to one task and fits other tasks, then wow, that uh, looks like a very much recyclable AI and its value would lie in it. So 
that very much depends on the criteria that you set. But uh, frankly speaking, I think we're on a very good journey towards defining these criteria better because like two or three years ago, we were like in a deep forest of unknowing. And here today we can say, okay, accuracy is an interesting, important parameter, but we can add some more. And socially, we are starting to formulate different types of questions, like whether I can trust the system. And again, you okay. would need to test. Thanks a lot, Alexander, for this insight. I've just remembered it was such a, uh, sorry, a year ago when we lastly has been on stage with us and it was incredible. Yeah. Hope to have you with us again. I mean, now we're going to have you on the next panel. So you have actually yes. to go, log in and uh, out and in again in another virtual room. And I'm looking very much forward to have you with us. It was our honor. Now, thank you. Welcome. So, and now back to you, dear audience. Don't forget to use the chat, exchange with your AI peers around the world, connect with each other as well as on LinkedIn, mentioning the speakers. And if you're not part of our community yet, I invite you to join our Swiss Cognitive group. Let's keep the conversation going during these hours and also after this event. There's really a lot to share and exchange about, which already takes me to our next session an exchange of experts in our topic today, how we can empower our machines and processes with AI so that they become more efficient. And when we succeed with this empowerment, do we talk about the rise of the machines or the rise of the humans? Well, I know my answer to that already. The fact that cognitive technology are there to augment the human being and not to replace that. I am already looking forward to our experts exchanging on the topic. On this panel, we will have Friska, who is going to moderate that. Friska, your experience in the fields of communication, strategy, and change management. You have been a change and transformation expert for the last decade and have worked with big international corporate clients. Your change programs have impacted thousands of people all around the world in several different industries. You focus on shifting the mindset of the workforce to embrace change and welcome the unknown. You help raising your clients' awareness and accelerate adoption and thus truly make digital transformation become a life. Friska is a digital transformation, definitely is one of the hottest topics of the last years in the business world. We can't wait to learn from your experience. And especially a huge thanks for waking up or getting up in the middle of night. Guys, Friska is from Australia. So a big applause to you. With you, we have Alexandra. I make a very quick intro to you again in case someone of the people just haven't heard it before. So Alexandra, you have been dictated from management and hold a PhD in philosophy of AI. You have conducted research in a center for collective intelligence at the MIT in Boston, and you have graduated from the New School for Social Research in New York. You're currently associate professor at the Department of Management in Digital and Network Societies and in leader of the AI in Management program at the Kosminski University. You're interested in the development of new technology, natural language processing, humanoid artificial intelligence, social robots, and wearable technologies. You're also the author of the Collaborative Society. Alexandra, we highly appreciate that you're here again with us on the panel. Happy to now, be here. Now, with you, thank you. With you, we have David. You are a serial entrepreneur and CEO in the field of AI and data science since 1995. You have co-founded five digital startups and lectured more than 300 keynotes worldwide. You advise CEOs and boards in their journey from the digital to the fully automated organization with your two books from Big Data to AI and Automate to be, sorry, Automate or Be Automated. You have had a real impact as author on the world of automation and AI. David, we are so thrilled to have you with us today and are looking forward to your insights. Then Thank you very much, we're glad to be here. Welcome. Then with you, we have Ahmer, you are Chief AI Officer at Pactera Edge, where you lead organizational transformation using AI and human-centric design principles. 
you use design thinking and AI innovation to build future forward AI enabled digital products to help the world's top brands deliver lovable experiences to their customers. Your experience includes leadership roles at firms like Nike, PwC, and Wells Fargo. You have more than 20 years of experience driving organizational transformation with intelligent digital solutions. You're an official member and contributor on the Forbes Technology Council where you publish your thought leadership and expert options on a variety of topics. My pleasure to have you here with us on stage. Now, Thank you. The, with you together, we have Cécile. Thanks. In the last decade, you have become an expert and international keynote speaker in the detecting trends and innovations for the future. You see technology as an essential tool for a future world in which humans have an improved quality of life. Your mission is to create an inclusive, equal, and future lit literal world wherein humans and the planet are the most important front runners. You are also convinced that the world can be more beautiful with technology, but only if we are able to develop a new vision of the values that are used in the development of it and have thus started the Dutch Humanized Tech Awards. I welcome you all on that stage, excited to hear your inputs and handing over now to Friska. The virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Dalia. Uh, when I think about AI and automation, Charles Darwin's words reverberate and they have reverberated through the years. So it is not the strongest of species that survive, nor the most intelligent. It is the one most adaptable to change. And I've found that this quote rings true regardless whether we're talking about animals, organizations, or individuals. So in an era where change, whether it be technological, consumer, societal, or legislative, it's happening faster, it's more complex and far reaching than ever, we cannot rely on the stock standard rule-based automation to achieve results. So we have to evolve, we have to adapt, and most importantly, we have to learn. So how can we accelerate the learnings from automation and apply these to supercharge our processes? Is it really about the rise of the machines or does AI present an opportunity for humans, for all of us, to rise to even greater heights? And so I'm eagerly anticipating uh, what our panel of experts have to say on, on the research um, that's making its way into industry. Who are the leaders and who are the laggards in automating algorithms? What are the challenges and opportunities and how can we better integrate human and artificial intelligences to optimize our processes. So I may start the first question um, lobbied at Ahmed. So the promise of AI, it's pervasively accepted, yet a paradox exists that the enterprise adoption is still very low. And speaking from my experience as change manager, this is very much rings true. Failure rate is still too high. So why do you think that is, firstly? And secondly, what steps do you recommend to enterprise leaders that they can realize the promise of AI? No, thank you. Thanks for actually calling it out. Uh, we hear so much about the promise of AI, but it doesn't get talked much about where the struggles are. And that is in the moment of truth, the adoption, mm. change management. And if we think about it, a lot of the AI solutions today are being approached as, and then a lot of the companies would sell it, that we take human problems and turn it into technology problems. And in my opinion, that is a first principle issue. If we the people who are going to utilize the AI solutions, we have to lead with that human centricity side of it, the cultural side of it, the context and the relevancy. Mm. So research after research is showing that when the systems are failing to be adopted are because of the issues related to trust, issues related to experience, issues around potential biases, and mm. all of that clouded with, to an extent, with cultural nuances um, and 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 a human desire to not accept anything new that is going, mm. going to drive change, right? Um, so we have to change the dynamic from a taking people problem into turning that into technology, but actually taking technology problem and turning into people problem. Uh, we have to bring humanity back into it. Um, that means leading with mindfulness, leading with purpose mm. and intention, understanding why we are doing what we are doing. 
in fact, like when we think about it, a lot of the AI solutions today are also built with task orientation. These are the discrete specific tasks people are doing today. Let's automate mm -hmm. those. Let's make them intelligent. And that's a perspective on efficiency. That's an efficiency of driving cost as, as a driver of the metrics, right? It's not speaking to why do we do what we do? When we change the perspective to why do we do what we do, then we are bringing that humanity kind of back into the process. Then we're building solutions for the future, right? Solving mm -hmm. the problems mm -hmm. for today and the future. The specific steps, in my opinion, are bringing the people for whom the systems are being built as part of the journey from the beginning. Do not build solutions that are looking for problems. Understanding mm -hmm. what and the why first before delving into the how and deliver with, with the best in class experience that people would love to utilize the systems for with trust okay. and responsibility. Yep. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, Cecile, I'm keen to hear from you. We talk about humanity. How does humanity intersect with technology development? Do we need a code of conduct for that? And what's the responsibility of corporates in this blueprint for future tech development? Well, thank you for that question, because I think that's at the moment maybe the most important thing in the future of tech, no, uh, tech, no, yeah, tech development, because mm. um, as we see, like we um, um, we are exponentially growing in innovation in every single field of, of our world. And uh, we developed so many code of conducts for food, for clothes, and but there is actually none for technology. And I think uh, technology is an area which is, uh, especially for consumers, which I prefer to call humans, actually kind of a gray area. And there's a lot of fear and distrust because they also have an um, often not the right knowledge or, or they cannot oh. like, um, yeah, they're, they're not able to see what the, the positives are or where the dangers are. And uh, it seems that with technology, we can like do whatever we want. Um, and I feel that we are on a sort of an intersection where um, often technology is developed because we can or because there is an interesting business model, but we do not ask ourselves, is it really a um, contributing to the quality of life of the specific target group or our planet. So in that sense, I really do feel that we need a code of conduct so that we don't just um, develop things because we are possible, like it's possible, mm -hmm. but because we really ask ourselves again, like, do we really need this? And I think there are so many examples where we uh, develop technology and as Amir already said, then we create a problem and then the answer, the solution is always founded in new technology. So it's actually mm. technology on technology, on technology, on technology, without asking ourselves, is there maybe another solution that's not only technology? So, and I yeah. feel the corporates should like uh, take each other's hand and say like, this is the value that we have in development. So we are, creating a blueprint with all of us. We are mm -hmm. agreeing on some rules and that is the guideline for future attack development. So I hope we mm. can manage that together, yeah. Okay, yeah, so just because we can doesn't mean we should. And that brings me to another point, which is automation versus autonomy. So Alexandra, how do you think we find the right balance between the two? What are the limits? Are, are there any? Keen to hear your thoughts. Mm. Well, I have to say that uh, I think my thoughts are very much in line with what we just heard from the previous speakers, because I'm mostly on the side of collaborative AI, normatively speaking, uh, systems that actually support human work. Autonomy to me is an interesting technological concept that allows us to build better assistive systems, but uh, autonomousness that would a result in creating systems that essentially skip through human expertise or replace fully human expertise um, is something that I don't think uh, is a very well desired uh, situation. Maybe in some isolated areas that could work mm -hmm. really well, but we are not uh, in terms of regulational frameworks prepared for that, in terms of legal frameworks. Societally, mm -hmm. I don't think we're prepared for that. And, Frankly speaking, our research team, this is something I've uh, discussed with Dalith um, during the interview previously, um, and our research work really focuses on, on creating AI where it's needed. And I think that goes back to Ahmer's uh, uh, remark on, on really asking people where they need that expertise. We've been working quite extensively with uh, marketers 
and we've been designing, um, well, assistive systems for them in their work based on fairly uh, complex algorithms, transformers, probably the best we have in term, mm -hmm. terms of like text generation today. And not only text generation, because they're capable of many other things. And, um, you know, it, it turned out that they have many different wishes in terms of mm -hmm. where they would see that system um, to actually alleviate and help in their work. And it, it's not a regular process that you can treat as something that can be implemented uh, top down. And you would say, okay, now everybody's going to uh, stop budgeting their campaigns because AI systems will do that on their behalf because it's a repetitive process and thus uh, there are no humans doing it anymore from today onwards. So I, I do think this approach will not work, uh, particularly mm -hmm. what we're talking about uh, non-ML, non-AI community, but business, like you said, uh, Friska. Uh, in business, the, the rules are different and there are many different branches of business and some of them AI develops very rapidly uh, logistics, if you will, uh, healthcare recently, and in some areas uh, it doesn't work that well. For instance, the legal tech, uh, well, it's a, mm. a sector is, is, is much harder, I think, uh, mm. asks many questions. And, and thus, I, I do think that um, we can talk about, you know, uh, well, automation is, is probably something that we've already covered to a large extent, but we can talk about autonomy in the context of developing stronger models. But in terms of decision making, I'd say collaboration and assi assistance to humans, essentially support systems. And normatively speaking, I think it, it's a much better situation and a much better scenario where uh, people obviously reskill and add new skills and work mm -hmm. with these systems where they feel that uh, that's a suitable um, uh, option and not, uh, you know, from automation to autonomy and kind of nothing in between, because that's, yeah. I think, a very turbulent scenario. I might um, interject to David at this point. You know, we talk, talked a lot about automation, talked a lot about AI, and a lot of business aim to be um, digital centric. But how do you define an AI first organization? What does that mean? And why do we need to automate? Well, I think uh, we are now in a new golden age of artificial intelligence. Uh, it's impacting all humans all across the globe and in all industries, of course. And I agree that we need to have human in the loop. That's uh, a good thing to, to have. But organizations mm -hmm. that want to be competitive need to use AI. And now, for now, big data is not enough. Even analytics is not enough. For some things, even artificial intelligence itself is not enough. You need to automate. But mm -hmm. an AI first organization has to use AI in its core. Of course, there are many uh, of the self things that you can you can use in any of the departments. But you need to start building AI capabilities in, in, the, in the core in the core of the company. And that is that, of, of course, starting with data. There is no data, there is no AI, there is no automation. And mm -hmm. it, I think if you want to really have an, an AI first company, you need to have it in, in all the areas, from the CEO to the board to all the, all the areas of the company and having these people uh, together to, to work these solutions for, for all, the, all the areas. Mm. So we quite a few of you have mentioned um, lack of trust, the distrust in technology and especially AI. So are there, you know, AI systems have quite well documented trust issues, I must say. So how do we build trust in AI? What are the first steps to enable this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crucial. We, we don't have an option. We have to mm. build trust. And as I mentioned, research is after research showing that the lack of adoption stems from trust issues. Trust is, a, is, a, is in how do we establish trust? It, it comes down to, again, going back to the intention and the purpose of the system that we're building. Explainable AI as a domain of expertise is rapidly growing. Uh, we have methodologies that can help understand and then demystify what's inside the black box. But even, even as the technology is evolving, we also have to understand who does it need, who is it that needs to know what's in the system and why? Is it that these are regulated sectors where AI could impact, uh, AI, AI may perpetuate systemic biases that exist that may negatively impact certain segments of the society and then they are regulatory concerned, then of course we have to build a system that can provide explanation for why AI is making the decision that it's making and it can be monitored and it can be continuously improved. But if the question for explainability is, I just need to know because I need to trust this system, and otherwise I'm not going to use it. Then we're mm. not approaching the problem the right way, right? In that case, the problem is goes, goes back to the design itself, the first principle approach itself. So the trust comes from transparency. Transparency mm -hmm. in, in terms of 
before the code is written, building a sense of trust and then, and then co-developing solutions together, understanding mm -hmm. the what and the why, leading with the human centricity of it. Understanding why, number two, why do we need to provide explanation? If these are methodologies that are going to be utilized that have to be explained to a regulatory authority, then of course, and then, of course, the explanation to the internal internal users. Maybe perhaps start with a white box regression based approach to a semi semi kind of a black box approach with with some approaches with machine learning that are easy to explain. But once that organizational trust over time builds up, then we can perhaps go towards autonomous systems where the organization has gone through that change management cycles to build it. But if we reject the people's request for, I need to believe in it, I need to trust it, I think that also already creates that us versus that di dynamic. So mm. some is essentially, who is it that needs to know it and then why? And kind of starting with those two questions and then figuring out, are there aspects that are organizational or are the aspects that are technical? Are there aspects that are regulatory related? Mm. So um, I might jump to Cecile again now. We're in danger of thinking that technology is the silver bullet for everything. It's just going to solve all our woes. So it's exponentially growing and we just simply can't ignore it. So do you still think technology is not always the answer to all our future challenges? Yes, definitely. And that doesn't mean that it cannot be solved with technology, but what mm. I believe is that we often see technology as the answer. And I truly believe it's more often the tool to uh, find a, a concrete answer, um, but it's it's like, it's not the answer. Um, and I think that is often what I already said in the previous question as well. Mm. It seems such a, a normal thing to uh, solve technology with technology. And I think the mobile phone is such an amazing, uh, uh, example of that because back in the days we also wanted to communicate uh, but nobody knew that we wanted a smartphone all of a sudden and then we had that smartphone and then we thought okay it can be faster so then we had for example the fact that we could um, make pictures and send them to each other but then we had the problem of the facts that uh, the fact that there are issues like sexting and all that kind mm. of stuff where we didn't even think of and then, okay, then we, we made a new app with technology again. So for example, Snapchat, because then it would be like gone and the, the issue was solved again. And yeah. then it, it, it grew into, uh, if I have a picture of on the internet of me, I can be like uh, photoshopped or like with all the AIs and big data and all kinds of technologies, I can all of a sudden mm. be on the body of a... Uh, of a porn uh, model without even knowing it. And then we are mm. developing new technology to try to conquer that uh, issue. So yes. Yeah. If we uh, took a step back in that whole process, that that maybe just being more- We're not going to the root cause of it. Mm -hmm. mm. Exactly. Yeah. And even yeah. if we look into the trends nowadays, we see that people like the big major consumer trends that are growing, our trends that are in the retro uh, area, back to mm. nature, back to the roots. So we, you can already see uh, um, looking at humans and consumers that there is such a, um, almost like, uh, like an overwhelming feeling of, mm. uh, can we maybe find solutions outside of the technological spectrum? So yep. I do believe that, uh, that that's also like a good area to look into and then have a better balance between the both solutions and mm. see tech as a tool and not only the answer, yeah. Mm. So you, you mentioned data there. I might throw it at Alexandra. What do you think about real-time data in the context of technology? So how should we handle this without having a fully connected world? Well, um, frankly speaking, um, lack of access to real-time data to me uh, quite often has been a pain in, in my kind of practice and my research practice and also in um, how I've been teaching my students uh, uh, who uh, kind of realize at some point where when they do face real-time data that it's a completely different type of context and a completely different type of of model that, that starts running there so I, I do think that it, it's it's very important you know in terms of like data policies obviously um, here in Europe uh, we have plenty of discussions about uh, regulating artificial intelligence. Again, uh, coming mm -hmm. back to the things that you've mentioned, all of you here, like trustworthy artificial intelligence. There is a regulation, the AI Act, right? 
concerning now high risk AI, but uh, really quite strong in terms of like when you think about uh, well, it's potential scope. We're talking here about banning to some extent certain types of algorithm and uh, algorithms in certain applications. We're talking about transparency, about demands of uh, regarding privacy. So it's like uh, I think one of those. Um, well, if it happens, if it really um, really gets mm. implemented, that's going to be a, a major change. Um, but uh, we also have discussions about data and availability of data. Here in Europe, uh, it's still an open discussion and I don't see that the solutions are out there. Um, and it is true that different types of data, um, real-time data, sensor data, is something that truly enriches various models. It's a completely different mm. um, situation than just applying historical data. And um, I, I do think that uh, certain, you know, proposals that are on the table regarding, let's say, open data pools that um, also medium, small size enterprise could use, for instance, mm. uh, if they don't have any other um, source of data that would not be super costly or inaccessible to them simply. Um, that's a very important part of the discussion. So, so to me, uh, indeed, I think artificial intelligence uh, goes hand in hand with the internet of things. Obviously there are many questions, many aspects of that, that uh, need to be looked at. As you know, maybe the, the proposal, the AI Act actually bans surveillance in public spaces and the use, mm -hmm. using of machine vision that would be able to detect people uh, in the public. So, you know, um, obviously that has to be uh, regulated and safeguarded. But on the other hand, I do feel like um, uh, IoT gives us another layer of context that I've mentioned at the beginning. And just for some of the processes, I don't know, I particularly think about applications in medicine and diagnosis and prevention. Uh, also, um, we've been uh, recently involved in a project uh, concerning construction sites and how you can use wearable technologies and sensors to uh, predict possible risks. Mm -hmm. Uh, and to avoid them uh, effectively. So in all of these spaces, you really need real-time data because feeding mm. historical data is not going, going to do the job. And, right. and therefore, so, I, I, I think it's yeah a necessity to have these two, AI, IoT, okay. together in a connected world. Yeah. Mm. We've all heard the saying data is the new oil. And not only is it the new oil, it's also a fundamental building block of automation. So David, what, how do we first start on our automation journey? What are the first steps that organizations should take? The first step is of course, trying to see the things that you repeat, because as we humans, the most valuable things that we have, of course, is one of them is our time, our health and the people that we mm -hmm. love to, but time is fundamental. If you basically lose your time repeating over and over the things that you do is the first thing that you need to, to go for. Even of course, at the, at the personal level and at the company's level. So the, the first thing to automate, of course, is try to see the things that you repeat, find them, and of course, try to see, to see if there is a technology that will help you automate that. With, of course, mm -hmm. again, the human in the loop and all the people involved to, to be able to repeat that thing. But instead of yes. repeating yourself, having a machine is repeating. The thing is that, of course, it's fundamental to not repeat and to not repeat, the only way to do it at the moment is in, is in automation. Physical automation, now with mm. the emergence of robotics, and later on, of course, with all the digital things. I might, I might stay with you. So I've implemented many predictive algorithms, optimization models for some of the biggest names in mining, engineering, and higher ed. And often there's a deep-rooted fear that AI is going to replace all our jobs. So mm -hmm. what are your comments about that? Well, I think that's totally true. I think all the jobs that we have at the moment will be at some point be automated by machines. The mm. thing is when they are going to happen and if the jobs of the future are going to be automated or not. But the thing at the end is, is a matter of competitiveness. If you don't do it, somebody is going to do it. The thing is, mm. if you want to compete as a company, you need to automate. So yes, all the jobs that we have at the moment and all of the things that we do, for example, is trying to automate the things, everything. And in that sense, yes, the, the answer is yes. All the jobs will be automated, at least from a technical yeah. standpoint. Of course, regulations and many other things will have to prevail to, to, to make it a reality. Uh, Ahmed, what are your comments? How do you see this substitution versus augmentation dichotomy? Yeah, no, thank you. And I think I kind of partially agree, or I think disagree with David a little bit. I think we will have more augmentation uh, versus complete substitution. Uh, if we can, if we can place the especially looking at the problems in the uh, uh, industry, right? If we place them in two by two met, met, uh, uh, matrix of homogeneous data driving homogeneous decisions versus heterogeneous data driving heterogeneous decisions. If we place two by two on a homogeneous decision versus data, we see that the, the discrete tasks, uh, homogeneous data coming in driving homogeneous decisions, 
that's, that they are ripe for automation, right? That's where mm -hmm. efficiency comes into play. Where we are utilizing heterogeneous data, driving very complex heterogeneous decisions, that's where autonomy, autonomous component comes into play. High frequency trading, real-time auction bidding for digital display, very complex amount of data coming in for driving very complex amount of decisions. Humans can't mm. do that. Then mm. we have the two spaces about where the homogeneous data driving heterogeneous decisions, for example, in medical sector, or uh, a complex set of data driving simple decision, how many of a product to make, right? So human experience and expertise are, are much, much more needed in those things because we don't have enough data to even train AI for those types of complexities. And mm. in that augmentation is, is the space we will continue to see more and more evolution. And then that's where I see that 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 interaction is coming to come into play. So when you talk about you know the starting at the the evolution aspect of it, right? So that's where the evolutionary aspect of it comes to play. So in my opinion, more and more tasks that are that are ripe for automation that will happen. But over time, perhaps the augmentation is the bigger uh, big big bigger mm. component. Yeah. So uh, you know we've talked a lot about humanity and there's a rising societal consciousness now and in particular uh, the topics of inclusivity, equality and a future literate world. So Cecile, how do we make sure that technology, especially AI, how do we make sure that humans and the planet are still the most important front runners? Well, I, this might be the biggest cliche answer ever, but I think it's uh, all about like the co-creation um, of this, uh, mm. yeah, of this technology, but also the education. As I said in the beginning, um, the technologies we make are often made for the bigger audience, but mm. they are made by the very smart, like the smartest people in the, on the planet, and. Mm. Um, and I think that's in, in a lot of cases that we forget that it's like not obvious to the biggest part of the world that that technology is there or what it can do and the benefits of it. So I think education and co-creation in whatever technology and expanding the technologies we have, uh, that that is like the key because um, I think the most important insights you get by asking the people that really have no clue about what you're doing, because that's the honest and you get the real insights of human needs. Um, mm. One thing, uh, I will do a very short explanation of what I mean, but when I was young, I went to India to do um, uh, development uh, aid work and uh, we had a whole system of how we could help uh, a lepra uh, village to integrate um, a, a, a garbage system. And then that guy said to me, they were totally unhappy with it. And he said to me, why are you thinking that you can make something for me? And you didn't even ask me if I want that, if I'm unhappy with the state I am in now. And that yeah. is a life lesson that I take or try to take in whatever I do. And I think that's also with everything we do with- Don't assume. Mm. Yes. Ask those for who it's meant. Mm, mm. And um, so we talked about trust, transparency, and how we shouldn't do things just because we can. So, Alexandras, what are some of the tools that you're working on which you actually think should not be automated? Um, well, I, I think I'm not going to talk about which should not be automated, but I'm going to come back to the very briefly, I uh, promise, uh, to the question of. Uh, you know whether they are even uh, whether it's even feasible for them to get mm. automated because I do think okay uh, David said an interesting thing that most of the jobs or uh, I'm more frankly speaking prone to speaking about tasks than jobs mm. can be automated but what does automation really mean frankly speaking I, I don't think that uh, systems that are capable of certain things today could really cater very complex tasks that uh, such complex mechanisms as humans are quite often performing, right? When you even think about engaging in various physical activities, that's so hard for an embodied robot. So maybe some sort of systems for the future, of the future, which we don't, I mean, won't be able to classify as, a, as AI. Maybe that will be a merger of synthetic biology and AI will be something that will actually be capable of, of, of doing certain things. But I do think that AI of today does have plenty of its limitations and it's good at certain things. And we pretty much know where it can intervene, 
but it's actually not so good with many other things that we do and that are trivial to us. So that's an interesting uh, kind of, I, I would say, intersection that we have here. But who knows? I mean, that's very speculative. I think AI, some sort of wetware of tomorrow, maybe it will be able to automate things and then we will have to have discussions about what should, what shouldn't happen. But as of today, I'm kind of kind of thinking, yeah. It's, mm. it's, 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 we're, we're still at the level where we're, we can only find discrete tasks that can be well automated in a truly effective way. Okay. Well, just, wow. That has been a supercharged 30 minutes where we leaned in deeper. We learned about the paradigm shift of human machine collaboration. And most importantly, the so what? The real world suggestions on how we can leapfrog beyond mainstream rule-based automation. I've been honored to moderate this panel. I'm going to go back to bed. It's 3 a.m. now in Australia. <laughs> so thank you so much for the experts tonight wow. for sharing their wisdom. Thanks. Thank uh, very thank much appreciated. Uh, remain quickly with me, especially you, Friska. Thanks a lot to get up so early. And I really liked one sentence you said, what for me somehow summarizes a lot. And that was like, don't assume. So mm. thanks for that. Now I can only thank to all of you with your great insights. It was a great job. And I know it's hard to fit everything into 30 minutes discussion. So thank you, Friska, for the great moderation. And Alexander, David, Ahmed, Cecil, thank you for your contribution. And I'm looking very much forward to future engagement, both on and off stage. And dear audience, if you're interested, actually Cecil and I will be participating at the ITU panel about human at heart, privacy, transparency, and accountability in AI tomorrow at 11 to 12 Central Europe time. So thanks a lot and see you soon. Now, bye. 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 And now let's jump into some industry insights. Who knows the AI Iron Man? David Schreer. I have to say we had some great discussion with David prior to this event. I can assume you, energy will not lack in this upcoming session. David, you are an American futurist, author, and entrepreneur. You also co-edited the MIT Connection Science imprint of MIT Press, and you are the author of various industry reference books in the fields of financial technology, digital identity, data governance, and financial innovation. You are the co-founder and managing director of ISME Learning, an AI-enabling an AI, AI enabling digital learning company derived from MIT research and spun out of MIT Media Lab. You currently serve as professor of practice in artificial intelligence and innovation with Imperial College London. So now, Iron Man in real life, fusing AI and human excellence. David, the stage is yours. Great, thank you, Dalit. Um, can you confirm that you can see my screen or do I have to relaunch the PowerPoint? It's up? Okay, great. Well, I look forward to sharing with you now Iron Man in real life using AI and human excellence. Um, so the first thing that we need to acknowledge is that AI-driven job loss is real and it's here, okay? Uh, a lot of industries, including financial services, healthcare, manufacturing, are being digitally disrupted and artificial intelligence is leading the charge. So, okay, if you think about the numbers, um, some project 30 to 50% job loss within the next three to five years. Elon Musk calls AI the most likely cause of World War III. And you know, the last time that, that uh, the World Economic Forum met in Davos, uh, people were whispering uh, in the hallways, not 30 to 50% job loss, but 99% job loss which would sort of result in a future a little bit like the Pixar movie WALL-E, where everybody is floating around in giant hover chairs doing nothing and, and the AIs run everything. So we need to reskill, right? People urgently need to step forward into the AI future rather than having it consume them. The bad news is that the education system that's supposed to reskill them is broken. Uh, you may have seen in the past uh, couple of years with COVID, 
uh, how bad remote learning is and digital learning and, and learning that's intended to be done while you're working in your career. Um, part of the problem is that we haven't upgraded the model in hundreds of years, right? So uh, this is the so-called sage on a stage. You have a wise person at the front of the classroom and everyone's sitting in neat little rows. In fact, some would argue this is actually something that hasn't been upgraded since at least 1000 AD when um, the churches began trying to educate more clergy en masse. Uh, and so had this sort of mass production of education. And lo and behold, if you look at Harvard University's venerable CS50 class, their main introductory computer programming class, you've still got exactly the same model. We're just repeating this online. All of the sins of the past are, are now brought forward to the digital era. I mean, sure, if you've got something like, like a TED Talk or, or like Masterclass, it looks nicer, but the learning outcome is still terrible. It does not prepare you for new skills that you need for the digital and AI-enabled future. Uh, I also note that it's a little ironic that the uh, best producing, the best performing TED Talk of all time is about how education kills creativity. So what's going on here though, the reason why this stuff does not work is that it ignores decades of advances in cognitive science and neuroscience. And in particular, if you do a master class or you watch a TED talk, you will forget more than half of what you learned in about an hour. So edutainment, sure, you feel smarter, but it doesn't actually help you reskill for the AI future. Uh, you could say, well, hey, what about major universities? What about uh, uh, you know the top universities in the world? Aren't there all of these multi-billion dollar ed tech companies that are working with the world's top universities to help us reskill for the AI future? Um, well, I have some bad news for you, which is if you take a class on, let's say, edX or Coursera or one of these other platforms, you only have about a 3% chance of finishing it. Uh, and, and to be more acute on that point, only about 3% of people who start these massively online classes actually complete them. This failure of education, this failure of the university system and of the corporate system to help us reskill into the AI future is not due to a lack of resources. In fact, there's over $400 billion that's going to be going into corporate training annually within a few years. So, so it's not for a lack of resources. I then asked the question, particularly in the context of thinking about how AI and autonomy kind of come together, what, what if cognitive AI could fix learning? What, could we use, what if we could use this technology that's disrupting everything to actually help us, the human beings, adapt to this new future? Let's think about this. Who's the world's best chess player? It is not, in fact, IBM Watson or another deep AI system. It's also not Magnus Carlsen. The best chess performance comes from bringing a mid-ranked human player together with a good AI. It's this fusion of the human brain and the artificially intelligent brain that produces results that cannot be achieved by either one by themselves. Which then begs the question, what if we all had our own Jarvis? So many of us are familiar with the MCU, the Marvel Universe, uh, uh, Iron Man movies, and, and how Tony Stark had this AI that was with him everywhere, that anticipated the future, that helped him think of things to do, but also enabled him to achieve certain outcomes. So what if we all had our own Jarvis? I turned to the MIT Media Lab where decades of research is bringing together artificial intelligence and cognitive and neuroscience to deliver a future that we didn't even conceive of. Professor Sandy Pentland, Alex Pentland of MIT, has been looking at this question of AI and human hybrid systems that take autonomy to a new level, where the machine is fused within your own work environment and produces results that are outstanding, that go beyond what the AI alone could do and what the person alone could do. The way it works is, in part, you have little nudges, positive feedback loops that provide 
changes to behavior as people are engaged in discussion with each other. As you are taking a class online, for example, you'll have this AI coach with you every step of the journey to help you do better. And demonstrably, measurably, and quantitatively, this delivers better learning outcomes. In fact, it goes well beyond learning, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Another thing that was happening in parallel with the developments at MIT around uh, this, this positive feedbacks and, and team performance in AI is functional magnetoresonance imaging. Okay, so fMRI has now been around for about 60 years. And the powerful thing that fMRI provided is we could actually see how your brain worked in real time. We could see what would happen if we tried different kinds of learning interventions um, and what the effects would be on your brain. And so there were a lot of different theories about how to teach you things, about how we could inject new knowledge into your head, perhaps around how to use artificial intelligence. Now, instead of there being a debate as to what would be the best possible course of action, we actually can measure it with fMRI. So we learned, for example, that team-based learning is much better than individual learning. And think about the typical online learning experience. You're sitting alone in a room clicking on a video. That's the exact opposite of what fMRI tells us works best. Project-based learning also is the most incredible way that we can take knowledge and apply it directly to practice. And finally, something that you know, the medical profession discovered many years ago, uh, it turns out is actually a very, very good way to learn. They, they say, watch one, do one, and teach one. Or I'll say here, watch, do, and explain. The act of sort of seeing something modeled for you, trying it out yourself, and then talking to your peers about it produces much more durable learning outcomes. So if we bring these things together, Professor Pentland's research from MIT and the lessons from fMRI, we want to learn how we work in teams. We want to have project-based teams with an AI coach that is in synergy with the team, helping us acquire the knowledge as we go. And there's 15 years of peer-reviewed research behind this approach that say that it works. After two or three weeks of having these team interactions with the AI giving you feedback and telling you what to do better and kind of massaging you through the process, you get transformational outcomes. Under the hood, what's going on is we've got fairly sophisticated signal processing. We've got machine learning systems kind of taking that data and munging it together to then play it back to the human based on this profound insight into how team dynamics work and what the performance of the best teams look like. And then how you can change teams, how you can move teams from low performing to high performing. If you take this personalized AI technology and you marry it to the science of collective intelligence, we can deliver 30 times better performance using these cognitive AI systems. We can take people from that 3% completion rate I talked about earlier to a 99% completion rate. The world's top universities are beginning to use this technology, not only for executive education, for the adult learner, but they're beginning to incorporate it back into their degree programs. What's coming next as we advance this technology Continuous coaching, adding more data, which will feed better AI, extending into the virtual and augmented reality worlds, and transitioning to industry scale, up, taking us from just being in the learning environment to applying this every minute we work. I'm Dave Schreier. This was a quick look at how cognitive AI can fix all of the job loss that AI is inducing. I've written a book about this if you really want to dive into more detail, and I'd be happy to hear from you. Thanks a lot, David, for your contribution, sharing your vast experience. We are looking very much forward to more collaboration with you in the future. Please remain with me, and I will skim through a few questions. We do have one question about how can AI be used positively to improve learning and increase the retention to improve Ebbinghaus retention duration to higher levels? Yeah, so, so par partly I've given you the answer in that, uh, you know, if the AI is kind of watching how you're learning, 
and is giving you feedback on it continuously, that improves your performance. Um, in terms of retention, it's a combination of AI and cognitive science. So it's actually not one thing alone, but it's a complex process that, that we've introduced. So for example, attention span, right? Most people would have trouble actually paying attention to that entire talk I just gave you. Your average adult attention span is two to five minutes. So most of you probably tuned out a little bit and then tuned back in when I said something interesting. I tried using a few techniques to sort of startle you and make you wake up, but, but in reality, the way that we deliver these online classes is we have a lot of little short interventions uh, and there are ways even in the future that we can incorporate additional AI systems to make the, the learning experience more dynamic. Great, thanks a lot, David. Uh, for all the others, please share your question on LinkedIn, tag David and Swiss Cognitive, hashtag Cognitive Virtual, and he will answer your question and everyone can benefit from it. Thanks again to the Iron Man in real life, using AI and human excellence. And now, back to you, dear audience. Don't forget to use the chat, exchange with your AI peers around the world, connect with each other, and as well with the speakers on LinkedIn, where you can also join our Swiss Cognitive group. Now let's keep the conversation going on during these three hours and also after this event. There is a lot to share and brainstorm about, which already takes me to our next session. And now comes another expert panel discussion with some incredible minds varying from primonology to academia to you name it. Our topic is empowering machines and processes by the small combination of human and intelligence. On the discussion, we do have our Tom. As always, it is my pleasure to have you back with us again and share this absolutely brilliant panel. Most of you already know Tom. Tom joined Swiss Cognitive a few months ago, officially as one of our facilitator and panel chair, and continuing supporting our team with his amazing talent, unlocking the potential of every panel discussion, captivating the audience. Tom, you are the founder of the AI Journal, a free open source information hub on AI and emerging technology. You have a passion for providing tools and resources to educate people on these topics covered on the AI Journal and provide the audience with an engaged platform to help them. Let me introduce you now to your panelists. We do have Maike. You are an assistant professor at university and founder of the Applied Face Cognition Lab. You are studying how face processing is achieved by the brain. Your research is supported by the Swiss National Science Foundation and you work together with various international police agencies in developing super recognizer identification. Mikey, we are happy to have you with us today. With you, we do Thanks have Jair. You have more than 15 years of experience in cloud computing, product management, project management, and product design. You have worked for several global corporate companies and have gained wide experience in our digital world by being in different positions. You focus on people's interactions with technology and are passionate about business analysis, data science, and AI with a wide multicultural background and a solid technology ethic. Jair, we are so happy to have you with us today, and we're excited to hear and talk to you about human and machine interaction in the future. Then we do have Uri. Shalom, Uri. You have Shalom. professional experience in product management, product development, machine learning, and deep learning. Today, you are an AI business consultant and community manager. You help companies turning their ideas and concepts of AI into reality and build them a complete AI strategy. Your AI community in Israel has more than 24,000 members. Uri, it's a pleasure to have you with us today and we're sure your inputs and AI implications will be highly appreciated. By the way, I hope I'll be in Israel very soon and happy to meet oh. you there then. Oh, no, what then, a nice surprise. <laughs> for me too. <laughs> then we do have Umberto. Umberto, you hold degrees in physics and computer science. You have more than 20 years of IT experience and have done research in both academy, academy and industry and machine learning 
for the past 10 years. You're also author of the book, Advanced Applied Deep Learning Convolution. Sorry, my tongue is like getting dry. Convolutional Neutral Networks and Object Detections. You are focusing on bringing academy, industry, and regulations together to successfully master the age of AI as society. Umberto, thank you for being with us here today. You definitely belong to one of our very first Swiss Cognitive followers and fellows. So, empowering machines, intelligence, Tom, the virtual stage is yours. Brilliant, thank you so much, Dalif. It's great to be joining you again today. And we've got a very great panel discussion coming up today following David's fantastic keynote. So don't want to take any more time after Dallas' great introduction. We'd love to jump straight into it. So Miki, I'd love to come to you first and get a feel for, you're a professor. So I'd love to know in the field of cognitive neuroscience, what, what does this topic mean? Because it's very important. If you give the audience a quick breakdown of what that term means and what your experience with it, that would be great, please. Yeah, so cognitive neuroscience is the study of how the brain processes information to enable behavior. So essentially, me as a cognitive neuroscientist, I'm interested in understanding how brain and behavior kind of happens, so brain-behavior relationships. And through my work, I really want to learn more about how human brains process the vast amount of information and the tremendous variety of information that the world provides us. So normally we don't think about how much information we process but still we we do so very efficiently in an extremely fast manner and we don't give it a lot of thought except for when things go wrong like in cases of brain damage or if we look at newborns and this is the kind of work that i focus in on to demonstrate the power of the brain very cool very good overview as well so i really appreciate that nice and quick as well which is quite interesting to be able to talk about a complex topic quite quickly so, Jer, I'd love to come to you, and it's quite an important point that uh, Miki made up, which is looking at the AI strategy for business. So how do you come up with a great strategy for business with AI when you are looking at topics such as cognitive neuroscience, analytics, all these things that come into it? We'd love to get your overview of that, please. Yeah, yeah. It's always complex to really to define a, a, a strategy in these complex topics, but normally we start to really ask what the problem I want to solve here, maybe, and even in the cognitive sciences and everything, we need to focus also always in the problem that we want to solve and maybe also about the data that we have to solve that, and then we, we compound everything with the tools available the machine learning models whatever everything that we have available to solve this problem i like to try to start from the problems hmm. very cool and it's good to start with a problem because a problem is where you get a solution right if you don't know the problem you're not going to get to a solution which i think exactly. a lot of companies miss when they look at we say a lot with strategy development and how you come up with it they want a new shiny tool such as rpa or intelligent automation but they don't have a roadmap for it they don't know what their challenge is and you ask them what they're doing with it in five years they sometimes don't know. So it's a very good point. So Yuri, I'd love to come to you because it leads into this very nicely. So from your viewpoint and your great experience that Dalif touched on, what would you say to companies or individuals the main obstacle is when you're implementing an AI solution to, to come over these challenges? So basically, in my opinion, the main obstacle is companies who are not prepared to implement these kind of solutions. Because before you are writing one line of code, I would say that you need to understand what you are getting into. So you need to understand if you have the right data or if you have enough uh, budget to train their models, if you are training machine learning models, or if you know how to put it in production. Sometimes the company is developing something amazing, it's working their lab, but they don't know how to do that in production. So you need to make a lot of preparation. What I see behind the scenes that a lot of companies are trying to throw uh, technologies and machine learning algorithms, all this uh, fancy stuff, but they're not waiting for a moment to think if this ready for if this if we are ready for that, if this is suitable for our organization, if we have enough data, GPU power, we know how to uh, engineer it to our system. So before you around to develop anything, start with a good brief and start to design and, and understand 
what is the entire problem as said before that you are trying to solve and then if you are prepared to solve that using machine learning or AI. Very good point as well because when you go to things like POC and you don't actually know what you want to be developing or doing goes back to the point earlier you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks so a great way to come over that point. So Berto looking at it from your background and your experience and this is a point that I want to come to later on to all of the audience and to all of the speakers for the audience sorry where do you see technical skills and resources uh, really being able to satisfy the current EU regulations. I'll quickly add, we saw a lot of these regulations coming into play and uh, we've seen a lot of the frameworks that companies and uh, the government, especially in the UK, are coming to build in. Where, where, where do you see that going, Umberto? Yeah, I think that that's a, a good point because there are, for example, the European Union has published the, the regulations about AI, you have strategies about AI, you have lots of things that... Uh, um, regulators are trying to say to force some companies, uh, but I think there is still like a, a large technical layer that is missing. So there are not enough people that actually knows what those regulations means. They're talking about explainability when most of the people have no idea what explainability is really. <laughs> right? So and uh, you have no companies, no idea what they should explain to whom they should explain. Right, and, and just, just hoping that, and I think that there is a, there is a problem when, uh, when you're trying to just putting on papers, like saying, oh, if it's explainable, everything will be fine and you can do everything you need and you can generate value from it. Uh, it's still in a, in a, say, a bit utopic because you cannot really like do that yet. Because I think there is also at universities, I don't know, maybe um, others have different opinions, but I think that there should be much more effort in like also uh, forming people and like uh, teaching like those topics and what it means because we have lots of possibility that many companies will simply not do because they will not have a way of actually working with data because for example in insurance or, or hospitals all the medical data is very sensible and uh, and many are so afraid about the, the, the laws and regulations that many I think will just stop using AI because they're not they don't know how to to actually work with data in a, you know, in satisfying laws and regulations. So, yeah, and it's a good point that you make as well, Mika. I want to come to you as well and look at it from how we see these things on um, the kind of neurological level. So, looking at what your background is, you're obviously interested in the way our brains work, what happens with this, how to kind of comprehend these ideas that um, Berto just touched on. And what would you say is the most impressive thing that we, we can do at the moment when considering how far along we are with applications such as AI? Yeah, so the most impressive thing in my opinion is face processing. So I think it's probably the most complex problem that can be solved and that's what I'm intrigued by and that's what my research is um, devoted to. Understanding how our brains process visual information that makes us recognize Tom as Tom and Umberto as Umberto. So um, that's actually really difficult and um, you know, a lot of people think that AI has solved it, but actually humans continue to outperform algorithms. And I will stand by that right now because there are super recognizers who can do this much, much better. Yeah, that's a great point as well, because you always look at it, we get the common thing that people come to us and they say, oh, but isn't AI gonna take my job? And I just think, well, no, it's gonna make your job more valuable and it's gonna make you enjoy it more. It's quite a simple fact that I can see. And I think that's a real, um, great point because I can see us leaning towards this training and development uh, kind of structure for this for this panel today and it kind of sets it up really nice from Mika's great view Yuri to come to you sir so I'd love to know what is the best way to know which technical solution is the right one it could be an API startup or it could be an API it could be a startup that uses APIs or even an in-house development what what would you recommend following Mika's great points so basically, she pretty said a great point. The way I see it is to understand what is the main focus of your company. My biggest tip is if you're not doing AI as part of your core, sometimes it's much better to see if there's on the shelf products that can help you. I've told many of my clients, look, you don't have to now recruit data scientists or get machine learning engineers. Please check if there are some um, APIs that can be relevant for you. So. My rule of thumb is if you are trying to solve some problem that's relatively common and you sure that maybe AWS or Google or Azure 
have already developed a solution for that, use that to begin with. This will give you a benchmark. This will be very simple to integrate, very cheap to integrate. So please check that. Later on, you can see that there is a great success and your user starting to use that new, new feature. And you find your market product fit, then you can say, oh, you know what? I want it to be my core technology. And then it's worth for you to develop it. So this is the way I see it. Start with small things that you can build with your own hands, something that this API and this API to see if there is any traction. And then later on, when you feel that you are ready and there is enough value that you can measure, then you yeah. can start building it on your own. Or even look for a startup that this is the entire uh, uh, um, product, but first start with small things and then you can expand. Yeah, love it. Great points as well. Great, great framework to get started, Yuri. Really brilliant. And looking at it from that point, Umberto, I want to come to you with a key question. I'd love to know this just personally. Are we preparing in academy people for the roles they really need for the AI age? Is there enough training and development there? Is there the right kind of people? And not only just in technical roles. We were having this discussion earlier. We need people for those sales roles, the marketing roles, the comms roles. What, what do you think, Umberto? Uh, I think that uh, so to answer your question directly, no. Um, to uh, maybe I should explain better what I mean with no because uh, I think that in the past years there was the the job profiles so or the job like the, were not really there was not really clear the distinction. It was the data scientist and it was the sexiest job in the twenty first century, and everyone wanted to become one. And uh, and and suddenly everyone was offering like every university every like uh, academy everyone was offering courses for data science right and yeah. i think that with time i think that people have noticed that there are lots of differences for example the data engineering job is one that probably most companies need and do not need much more than that um they're still advertised as data scientists and i think that with time i think that uh, many universities are starting to see the differences and i think that many companies are starting to see, for example, the fact that if you really want to do machine learning, you need a bit more than just SQL and, and writing like and, and maybe creating a small report. So I think that we are not yet there. And I think that uh, there are also a problem between like companies that, I mean, you have like many, many universities that produce PhDs with huge skill pool. But the problem is that company is not the environment and the culture. They don't offer what those people need. So there is still like this kind of uh, two silos, two words where you have like very skilled people, but you don't find companies except maybe Google and Facebook that can actually create an environment. Uh, so for standard companies, I would say it's very difficult to get really good people, but I think it's more like a cultural uh, problem than um, kind of what problem you're trying to solve kind of thing. Yeah, that's a great point as well, because culture is a big thing, right? Looking at it from how do you get this kind of grassroots level coming up through the business uh, to understand these kind of complex topics? Because we're seeing more and more uh, companies building these kind of hubs or information centers like you like you touched on, Umberto. Uh, I think UiPath is a great example of that. Some say that's how they, they built the company to what it's worth today, off having that kind of community knowledge sharing path. So I think that's great. And it kind of wants me to bring it to the next question, Jair. I'd like to come to you, sir. And look at data with, when you're looking at data, what considerations you need around AI ethics. So it's a real broad point because it's becoming broader as we get more and more of these companies come about. What, what, what do you think? What's your current view on uh, the importance of data and ethics? Well, I should say that I'm pretty worried about this topic because it's, we, I don't think we are really talking about enough about this if we consider that AI is becoming really ubiquitous across our many most important business process. And here we have the risk that whether or not we are acting ethically in sharing and getting the right insights from our data. So uh, for example, we need to understand if it's the data insights that we are getting are legal or yeah. they're going to create social or economical injustice somewhere. So this kind of, of process that we call data ethics, it's really the code, the basics of to code the behaviors, the human behaviors that we describe of right or wrong, and we need to trans transfer these for 
our our development of artificial intelligence. And uh, there's a lot of questions that the, this data ethics answer. And my, but to answer this question, we need to to understand how to identify, prioritize, manage all these risks associated with data. I'm really concerned about this because I believe that more and more companies should should talk because there is also a business value on be ethical on the data today. It's not only because we know the what is right is wrong. You know, with data ethics, with good ethics, you have good business today. Yeah. Companies, business leaders must understand this because we are, you know, if we, we have, uh, if a company today fail you to be ethical, they will certainly fail on be trusted by our consumers. And yeah. then it's going to reflect on the business. So we we need to have more focus on this discussion. Hundred percent, hundred percent agree. And it really annoys me because we've looked at this, and it is a it is a, I completely agree. It's a topic we need to discuss. And but you always, I almost think, and I don't know if this is just me. I think how do we get it so wrong all the time? Surely a business should be in business to do the right thing, just naturally, like organically, and it should be just a natural thing. It shouldn't have to create an ecosystem around it of telling people what the right thing to do is. But I mean, that's yeah. a discussion for another day and it's more of a personal opinion. But I love that you've got that view. So, Micah, I want to come to you and look at the current research where we're talking about exceptional people across loads of different areas. And you've talked about it from neurological side. And we've had some great examples from uh, the other sides of actually using ethics and data. I've noticed you're also an advisor to the Berlin State Police. How how does this all come together, Mike? How does how do we see this all come together and use it to actually help people? Yeah, so basically different police agencies are interested in humans who have an exceptional innate ability of processing facial identity. So these so-called super recognizers are kind of at the high performing end of a normal distribution. So we don't know exactly what's happening in their brains yet, but we know that they exist. And for obvious reasons, you know, security agencies are interested in deploying them or at least trying to select the best people to do the most critical jobs. You know, let's say if you're looking for a perpetrator in the context of a terrorist attack or something like that. And, um, you know, the idea is really to find the humans who are best at the things that the computers can't do um, and really to combine the strengths of, of systems that are either technology or that are human based. Yeah. And Michael, I just want to quickly ask you, what's your what's your view on facial recognition in that case then? Yeah, I knew that would come, of course. Um, so I think facial recognition or the boundaries and the limits um, are not very well communicated in the public media. You know, the impression rises that, you know, automatic face recognition is infallible. But, you know, there are reasons why a lot of agencies or countries have, you know, moved away from their deployment. Um, there was uh, a really interesting report where they compared commercially available softwares on the errors that they made and this was the report that gave rise to this racial or ethnic biases in the in the automatic errors and i have to say to that these were algorithms that were commercially available that were tested on ideal images so everything was full frontal everything was visible and that i think is problematic so they make mistakes that humans would never make yeah and it's always going to be a communication thing as well i think like you mentioned at the start it's uh, with any kind of new technology that comes or legislation or anything that comes in you always have to look at it. how do you communicate this to people that need to understand this, which is exactly what yeah. we try to do at AI Journal. But I'd love to come back to what we were talking around. So uh, the success of a project. Yuri, I'd love to come to you with this question. Mm -hmm. And then I've got a few questions for Jair and Umberto around uh, the talent development part. But how do you measure the success of an AI project? So how, how do you measure it? And then how do you understand it so you can implement it better into that business? So this is <clears throat> a great question because first there is many ways to see if an algorithm is accurate enough. There is precision and a recall and F1. So there are many, many ways to measure it, but sometimes the business side don't really understand them. So basically the way to measure it is to understand what is the business value you are trying to get when you are building an AI model. And I want to give an example, a recent day example. I'm sure that you're familiar with all the noise now with Zillow and their algorithms that 
have totally crashed and they blame the algorithm that wasn't good at the house pricing and et cetera. But the main problem is that the algorithm was good, but the businessman and the woman didn't want to listen to it because the competition with open door, they keep raising and raising the, the, the valuation of each house. And then they said, okay, the algorithm is not good, but basically it was good. So my entire uh, point is that you need to understand what is the business value of your algorithm because the algorithm can give you a number, but you need to interpret and you need to understand what do you do with that number? How does it affect your strategy? And then later on to actually implement it inside your business. Otherwise, it's just a number. So yeah. you can look on the very um, simple side or I got 90% accuracy. Okay, but what does it mean to your business? What does it mean to the entire ecosystem that you are living in? So don't always look after the numbers. Try to understand the bigger picture. Those 90%, it sounds amazing, but how do you see that in actual business that you are trying to do? Uh, so this is my key value here. Don't look or be amazed by the numbers, trying to understand how you can actually make it as part of your business plan and part of your product and how it's blending together. Yeah, that's a great point as well, Yuri, because looking at it from the different tools that are available, right? So you've got all these different, we've got a wealth of tools available to us now, wealth of programs available. And someone came back to us and said, well, a developer tried to sell them something. They said, that's great that it can do all that, but it can't do it for my business. And, and ended up being this conversation is pretty much useless because it's not, although it's a great tool, you don't understand the goals my business needs to achieve and it can't help me get there. So I think you touched on a really great point. Mm. And I'd, I'd love to come to that with the next question that I have for you, Umberto, looking around diversity and inclusion in tech. So obviously to get these areas, we need people from all different backgrounds. So we need people to spot the different areas and spot how we're going to make better decisions and leverage people from all around the world. What is your view on getting more diverse and getting more inclusion in the tech space? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, it's a very difficult question. I, I think it, it's really important simply for the reason that it's a thing that the machine learning AI, it's probably the most interdisciplinary kind of research that you can do, uh, especially if you work in industry. I mean, it's uh, like you need like uh, every kind of people involved from the you know people that deploy things to people that has contact with clients. And, and so the, the more people you have in, in the, in the process, the better the product is. Otherwise, you have no chance of getting something that people will use at the end. Um, regarding, like, uh, I think that one of the, again, we go back to, to culture, because, for example, I've done uh, uh, a lot of mentoring for the Women Tech Academy, for example, that Google organize, like, every year. And uh, the, the most common, so the most typical uh, thing that I hear is that there are very good, for example, women in tech, that are bored to death because companies like the culture is not there and they would like to do more. And, and, and very often is a cultural thing that, that uh, also may play a role there. So, and I, I, I have this kind of this dream where like industry could work with academy together to actually offer also some kind of an environment where People in industry can also work on interesting projects, learn stuff, and uh, an academy can learn from industry to solve their problems. And, and having this kind of both, like, you know, like this, this junction between the two would be probably the perfect way of, of, you know, motivating people to do cool stuff because they can do research stuff but still work in industry and, and bring everything together. And I think that will probably bring also diversity to play because you have to mean. In academy, you have also maybe a bit more than industry. Yeah. I'm not sure. I don't have any statistical data, to pick, but I think I have this kind of dream that that would really make a difference. I think, and until we get there, and everyone thinks the industry thinks academy, oh, they don't know what what, what we need, and and vice versa, will be very difficult to yeah to reach this point. I think. I hundred percent agree, Umberto, and it's kind of reminding me on your great point. We're talking around it, talent development, diversity, and there's a great book, um, How to Think Like a Rocket Scientist. And they look at what basically Google did with their, I don't think it's called Google Garage, but they basically put up this lab and they came up with all these cool ideas, whether it's the balloon and all these different initiatives. And they realized they couldn't actually get the program up and running because they didn't have the salespeople. So they had to bring in a salesperson 
take all these ideas and actually put them to market because yep. they were just engineers and it wasn't leaving the den, as we put it. So I think it's a great way. And I could see you nodding your head, Jer, with uh, along to what Umberto was saying. How important, as, as we come to the end of this, how important is talent development? It's fun. For, when it comes to AI, it's fundamental because it's, uh, Umberto mentioned, it's multidisciplinary. And it means that in company, you must, you must look this in a multidisciplinary field, but also a multi-level field, because there are several levels of maturity. There are several dimensions in the company that you need to integrate. The company, to be successful, in my opinion, with AI in the business, must to grow from the bottom to the top in a very, in a community way, everybody taking everybody to the next level. If you left some parts like the sales that you mentioned behind on the AI education, you will miss some parts at the end that, okay, what are we going to do now? So this is must to be a, a, a collaborative work to build the culture across the company. Yeah, love it. And that's a great answer. And just wrapping up with the final things, you, made, you touched on a great point. So actually in this last kind of minute we have, if we quickly go around and Michael, I'd like to start with you, please. Looking at it from, Culture, training, and development. Quick twenty seconds. What would your question or piece of advice be to the audience that are kindly joining us here today? Do you reckon? Be critical. Think like a scientist. Be curious, and always ask questions. Try to optimize things, and yeah, that's it. I love it. That's a great answer. Umberto, what do you think, sir? I, I would say that that two companies uh, sits in the driving seat, and if you want to get good people, then prepare them, and not expect that someone else. Do it for you because uh, probably your academy would not know what you need. Then. Yeah. Yeah. So do right. it yourself. Yeah, I love it. Uh, and you, Yuri, what would you say, sir? You're on mute, I think. And maybe sometimes machine learning is not the solution. <laughs> this is my biggest tip for my all of my clients. Let's start think that the solution is not machine learning. If we don't see a solution, then we start there. So. Think about simple solutions, then go for AI and machine learning. It will be always there for you. Yeah. Well, think about strategy, and then you can actually pick the yeah. tool, like you're saying. I love that. Proper thinking forward. And Jair, what would you say, sir? Well, I think AI, if you, as you said, if you go for AI and machine learning, I think it must be ethical and it must be diverse because there is all, all these three, these two aspects will take the company to the next step. So this is my point. Yeah, I love it. Some great points. I basically picked up that diversity, ethics, training, all key things. The tools will always be there for you, but the people are ultimately what drive these great transformations and drive innovations and drive solutions. So I think those are great points. And just before Dalif kindly wraps this up, I want to say thank you to the audience and thank you to each of you, Jair, Yuri, Umberto, and Micah for joining us today. I really appreciated it. Learned a lot in this short time and uh, looking forward to continuous conversation offline. Thanks. Thanks Thank also you. from our side. As always, Tom, it was such a great discussion. You really unlocked the potential of our panels. And I just would like to mention one thing, listening to you and especially when you've, you, you wrapped it up, Nike, listening to that is kind of, we can learn so much from the kids. They are curious, they're looking into it, they're actually exploring and learning by doing in an iterative way. So this is just what came up into my mind. You have a really great talent to make this bridge and pull this conversation together, Tom. Thanks a lot. Thanks to all the participants. It was great having you with us, sharing this great content. And I hope really to see all of you very soon again and hopefully also physical now dear audience don't forget to connect with our speakers like mike tom and uri and umberto and jay and linkedin ask them the question you were sending to us and keep the conversation going on exchanging all together we can only grow when the global ai ecosystem together with joint forces and now we're putting the spotlight on another great mind. Actually, Andy and I had the pleasure to virtually meet Thomas, the AI nerd. 
And the three of us were electrified by each other. Our exchanges are exploding, both with content and with lots of humor. Thomas is officially our Swiss cognitive AI nerd. Thomas, you have more than 20 years of experience in business administration and information systems. You are an expert in intelligent automation and AI systems. You are a LinkedIn influencer with over 100,000 followers and host of our own AI, of your own AI YouTube channel. As CEO and founder of Instarel.ai, you automate content creation for thought leaders. Furthermore, you are a contributor to Forbes Tech Council, AI Journal, Entrepreneur.com, and you are a Swiss Cognitive Senior Advisor. Thomas, it is a pleasure to have you with us, and we are looking forward to talking about AI in the world of marketing. Dear listeners, stay tuned and listen carefully because Thomas is a very fast talker. I almost can't listen as fast as you speak. So the virtual <laughs> stage is yours. Thank you. That's, that's a very kind intro, and uh, I will do my best to slow down. I do apologize a little. I hit the karaoke machine a little bit hard this weekend with just a little too much Neil Diamond. And you can't go wrong with too much Neil Diamond. Put it in the comments if you disagree. But um, thank you so much for having me. I, I, I look forward to speaking. Uh, do I present? What's next? You know, I'm, uh, I, you know, AI is easy. AV is hard, they say. So, oh my gosh, look at that. That's a beautiful, beautiful deck. Today, we're going to talk about um, AI to Thomas, but how you can leverage AI to accelerate content creation. And it's, it's an interesting space because, uh, because there's a lot of AI writing technologies out there today. And, but I think we should just start with something. First of all, if, if you ever, it, here's the question I pose. If you ever try to written an article, a blog or a post or any content, put it in the comments if you have. And because if you have, you know, it's a giant pain in the ass. It takes too long. It is, it's expensive. It usually doesn't come out the way you want it. it and at the end of the day, you, you kind of feel like you've created something that no one reads. And if you've had this feeling, you're not alone because this is kind of the motivator of why I was looking to leverage technology like an AI to accelerate content creation. I, as, <laughs> as it was pointed out, I do speak quickly, uh, but I, I have a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas. But when I went to go put pen to paper, I found it incredibly difficult. So I ran some experiments on how I could leverage AI and to use it. And, and, and I had to ask myself this fundamental question, first of all, was why is it so important to even create content? Is it to get noticed? Is it to, uh, to just be heard, to become a thought leader? And the truth is to create a revenue opportunity, you've gotta, you have to create content. And that could be anything from the blog or the article or the post, or even the, the script in a, in a video. You need to communicate a value. You need to communicate uh, your ideas and your thoughts. And to do this, you need, you need to be able to write it down in content. So if you're going to sit there and you're going to write it all yourself, uh, you're going to take too long. So leverage AI in, in, the, in the approach. But in, in the traditional approach, as you know, though, it's slow. It's super expensive. And there's almost no scale behind it. So if you want to create high volume, high quality content, and you want to go the old way where you, you have writers and editors and you have a whole process and it takes forever. You're just not going to get there. So to affect change at a rapid scale and to create content to communicate what you think you need to, I, I strongly recommend using a combination of things. Now, I do believe you need AI. I believe if you're not leveraging AI to do curation, initial write, discovery, uh, you're missing a really large opportunity to create content. Second, you still need people. Humans are still in the loop. Now, my expertise is in intelligent automation systems, and this is where you leverage technology to automate and accelerate business process. I'm not on the quite the page that you replace the human with this quite yet. The technology is just not there. But if you add AI plus some expert, experts, you still have a big component missing, which is the strategy. And you need a really good strategy of what types of content you create, how you create them, what they say, where you use them, when you use them, how to leverage them correctly. And that strategy is incredibly important because it could ties the value and the speed of what you'll get from the first two. And if you do that, you will get some epic results. Now, I will come next to this. These are the questions that always get asked. 
every time someone starts thinking about writing with AI. One, why not just use AI only? And the discussion today on, on, on the stage has been, you know, AI is gonna take over jobs and replace everybody. I don't quite believe that's, that's true. I think what's gonna happen is AI will be leveraged in the cycle as, as humans recreate, how you, as you accelerate a human. So AI is not ready to take over for writing. There's some really good technologies based on GPT-3, GPTJ. One is the open AI version, one is the open source. So you still need a human to complete the article, to give it your tonality, your diversity, your knowledge, your sets of uh, ideas. Another question always comes up is, is how do I use these experts? And it's also when. So after you've gotten an idea for a topic from an article, and maybe you've leveraged AI to do the initial write or the data discovery or the top five things about the subject, use an expert writer to help you flesh out the, the structure and the tone of the article. You don't want to do it yourself. And the reason is because it takes too dang long and you probably should be using that time to go engage with the content you create, not, uh, not create it yourself. And I would recommend a few technologies out there. Almost any of the AI writing technologies that are available will accelerate you from, from, from conversion to copy, Jarvis, uh, Kundera, AI, AI writer, uh, all of them, writer.com or writer.ai. They all will accel accelerate you, but each one does something a little bit differently. So some do short form better, some do long form better. And, and what we do is we try to leverage all of them, including our own, to accelerate you based on what you're trying to accomplish. Remember, AI plus experts plus strategy. So you can use any of them, but I recommend using as many as you can or afford to accelerate you. And there's a and, and when you do this, you'll you'll really see what I say is do you really get expert results? The truth is yes. If you can learn how to leverage AI at scale to create an incredible amount of content without it costing a bunch and taking a long time, you will see more followers, more leads, more ways to get inbound results from that, ways where people will connect with you. And the question always comes up: what kind of content do I need? And the answer is all of it. You need blogs, you need articles, you'll need posts, you'll need video, you'll need memes, you'll need polls, you need all of it. You need to leverage each one at the right time and accordingly, because sometimes that social media algorithms will favor one version of or another. Some weeks they like uh, gifts, some weeks they like images, some weeks they like an article, some months they like posts. It just really depends on what the trend is and what people are, are consuming. So you have to have all types of content ready. You also need to be able to do it at, at scale. So I will tell you this, that you can't chase perfect. Perfect is a black hole in a center of which you'll never get to. You come up right to the event horizon, which is good enough, it's close enough, and you ship it out. If you chase perfect, you won't move fast enough. You won't be able to create enough content to go across all your social media or your blog or whatever you'd like. Do not chase perfect. And I'll give you maybe the only one exception is for the bigger white paper pieces that you do for a use case. You can go a little more detail there, but when you create content, leverage AI and do not, do not chase perfect. It will absolutely kill the cycle and make it go way too slow. And the other piece is, how do you learn more? This is my favorite thing, the shameless plug. You got to contact me, of course, and I will teach you a lot more of how to do this. The, the, the idea is go experiment, go try it. If you don't contact me or you go to somebody else or go try it yourself, you have to get out there and try it. And so if you are in the middle of writing an article, I, I ask that you go out and you go ahead and get an AI to try to write it first, and then you go and prove that AI. It'll have access to a lot more data than you will, and you'll be able to write it pretty darn fast. These are the kind of the main questions from this, and, and what I've seen in my own uh, personal profile is, is, is with a fact where I've leveraged the, the ideas of these questions and these principles to really produce a ton of content at scale very quickly on a number of topics um, for ourselves and others. Um, I've offered the questions, but I also will put some questions out there um, in, in the idea of, I'd love to answer some for you. So I'm just checking the questions, hold on. I love your iPhone matches your shirt. My favorite thing of the whole day. Yeah, everything. I mean, I think it was intentional. <laughs> And actually, this is something that comes with AI also. I'm mentoring uh, one of my youngest mentees. She's 14, and she's actually developing an app where you can match, you know, your clothes with the jewelries, with everything. So for me, it's actually uh, 
very insightful and very happy to see when when it's ready. So first of all, thanks a lot again, Thomas. And you know what just came up to my mind? Quite at the beginning, I would say perhaps the second year, people came up and asked me, how come that you're providing so many information? Are you using, I'm sure you're using AI. And then we go like, of course we use AI. I mean, if not we, who else? And the person was kind of, I knew it is AI, but you should do it by yourself. I was like, come on. I mean, this is the essence of technology that we need to use the power of technology for our benefit. So let me check quickly uh, the questions. So hold on. Uh, do you meta search engines, Thomas? Do I meta search engines? Yes. I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> I, I will tell you, I tend to bring the average IQ of any conversation down. So uh, I'm not sure what, if I meta search engines, what they mean by that exactly. I want to answer the question correctly. I can make up an answer me, regardless. Me neither. So whoever asked the question, please <laughs> clarify in the chat. They're going to send it to me into the WhatsApp. Uh, but we have some others. When there are other tools available, what makes you different? So what kind of tools are available? Yeah, absolutely. So what we're, we, we, I've taken the approach of more of a suite of tools uh, because they all do things a little bit differently. It's just knowing when to use we, which. So what we combined are all tools plus our own to, to create so the idea is you just don't want to create an article or content for content's sake. You have an outcome in mind or a goal in mind. So what we try to do as far as part of the strategy is produce that outcome in the best manner, leveraging the right amount of technology and the right technology with the right people to affect what you want. Uh, less so than just how fast can I write it and what's the tool would you use? It's leveraging it at the right moment in the right place. And that's probably the differentiator is just the, the approach and methodology and, and knowing when to do it. Thanks. Another one? How accurate is AI at collecting information from research papers given access problems? <laughs> well, if it can't get access, it can't, it can't quote it and it can't reuse it. Um, however, it does have access to it. It, it will certainly leverage it. Uh, it does provide the transparency and it can, of where it got the source and it can do all those things as well. But if, you, if it doesn't know about it, it, it can't write about it. And so that's where your knowledge sometimes will come in as an expert to know that there's a research paper that you want to quote. AI is good for kind of filling in the blanks on other things you just maybe have forgotten about or just didn't have time to go additionally research. Okay, thanks. What I actually liked is also what you said, that actually human needs to improve AI, that we turn the whole thing around. So thanks a lot, Thomas. The other question will raise up in the LinkedIn. Please reach out to Thomas. He's really a brilliant AI expert, the AI nerd. Thanks for sharing Thank you. your experience, both from professional and personal perspective. These are exactly the stories that we like to share with our community. Real stories that people can relate to and learn from. And this is what we had with you today. So. Now we're coming to our next speaker. I'm thrilled to announce our AI Power Decisions, the why and the how. This panel will be led by our Swiss Cognitive Fellow, Ganesh. Ganesh, you are calling yourself a technologist, storyteller, and entrepreneur who's passionate about data and AI. You're fascinating by its power to augment the human experience at the very early stage of your career. And as an educated engineer, you successfully founded and grew business units at Dell. You proceeded an even more entrepreneurial journey after that and were working early with Cognitive Scale, co-founded Molecula. You also have a show called Stories in AI, where you interview AI leaders around the world and capture their stories to inspire action in AI. So please, AI thought leaders out there, get in touch with Ganesh if you want to share your thoughts with him. Very cool. Let's introduce to your panelists, Ganesh. We do have Effie. 
Effie, you have more than 30 years of experience in the field of finance. You're an international speaker and have been voted as the number one global woman influence in finance and the data conversations by Refinitiv Global Social Media. You are a seasoned Wall Street professional and a top thought leader by Analytica. Five years ago, you have founded EFI Pilaniru organization and are now in an independent fintech and blockchain advisor. Welcome to Cognitive Virtual EFI. Together with you, we have James. You are a technologist, futurist, entrepreneur, and angel investor with more than 25 years of experience in building companies. You are passionate about helping companies grow by adapting technology exponentially. Your interests range from optical computing to VR to AI. You are official member of the Forbes Technology Council, and eight years ago, you have co-founded Rainboard that helps companies automating human decision makings. James, welcome on stage of the Cognitive Workshop. We're all looking forward again to your insights about human decision making with AI automation. With you, we do have Eric. Eric, you hold a degree in physics and computational neuroscience. You have worked on mathematical modeling of the brain, deep learning, and traffic simulations. At your current position as a product manager analytic at the Swiss Federation Railway, SVB, you focus on establishing advanced analytics in business processes. You're passionate about open innovation and research collaboration with helps to accelerate the adoption of state-of-the-art research finding in different industries. Eric, we highly appreciate your time and are excited to find out more about your expertise and your view. Welcome on stage. And with us, we do have Giacomo. You hold degrees in physics as well as a PhD in material science. You have an extensive experience in research, machine learning, data science, and digital transformation with a track record in optimizing investment operations. You have led projects from the implementation of technology that automates capital allocation reducing risk exposure. You guide your clients towards becoming a data-driven organization, and you are aiming to bridging the gap between academia and industry to tackle future challenges our society is facing. Giacomo, we are so excited to hear about your experience with machine learning in financial investments, AI-powered decisions, the why and the how. Dear Ganesh, the virtual panel is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dalit. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And it is amazing to have an amazing set of panelists with me today. I'm really honored to actually be speaking with you again back in the event. And really awesome to have like Effie, James, Eric, and Giacomo on this panel. And today in the next 25 to 30 minutes or so, we're going to be focused on the how and the why of AI power decision making. And specifically, we're going to dive into what processes and what kind of activities are best automated through intelligent automation or AI or not. So uh, with that, I'm going to start with uh, a very quick, um, you know, 30, sec 30 seconds from everybody. One question for everybody in the panelists, right? Uh, talk about the state of AI from the spectrum of just pure intelligent decision-making to full autonomy in your specific industry. And Effie, why don't you kick us off? You're on mute, sorry. I'm bringing uh, my uh, insights from the banking or the financial services industry that um, today uh, is, is early, I would say, in the spectrum of moving from automation to autonomy. But what is, um, I think, very positive is that AI is being used across many businesses in uh, the financial services sector. And we'll have the opportunity to talk more uh, because we are also seeing another mega trend where financial services are offered by non-financial institutions and their automation is playing another important role. Absolutely. Thank you, Effie. I mean, financial services is definitely getting uh, you know, disaggregated as a service is not just one institution. James, what are your thoughts? 
So I think, you know, um, financial services is probably, again, the biggest area that we are working in. So we're a platform business focused on automating uh, complex human decision making, but it's still in very narrow domains. So we're automating, you know, tasks um, or processes that are still very narrow and very specialist and very much still, you know, focused on human in the loop. I think healthcare as well is beginning to adopt more of these technologies, uh, but again, in a very hybrid uh, machine and human working together kind of way. Thank you, James. Uh, Eric, let me go to you. You come from my one of my favorite futuristic industry, which is very you know omnipresent today, transportation and mobility, right? And what are your thoughts on the state of autonomy and automation in the industry? Yeah, I, I like how you said the futuristic. Uh, so I, I work in, in the part of uh, transportation that is very traditional. So from uh, in the railway industry, and here I think automation in the, uh, the business processes will be one of the biggest game changers to kind of shape the mobility of the future. Uh, but here, um, as it is a traditional industry, we have a lot of legacy systems and a lot of uh, bad data. So here it's usually the, the way forward is keep it simple, stupid. I always say, uh, try simple things, small steps, take the low hanging fruits. Um, but big things to happen in the transportation area, I think. Yeah, people often underestimate how uh, effective outcomes can be over the long run and overestimate what they can do in the short run. So, I mean, transportation is a great example where, you know, decades or even centuries of changes have gotten us to where we are, but the opportunity with mobility as a whole is so huge uh, that I'm really excited to hear your thoughts and the later on the pa uh, panel. Giacomo, tell us about what you're seeing in your industry. Yes, I'm in the same industry as Effie, and uh, we also had uh, the opportunity to discuss together and uh, share some thoughts. Um, my opinion is that uh, one day, of course, uh, automated decision, automated decision, they will take over for sure. Like if we think in the in the recent past, basically many financial operations required making decision based on predefined rules, right? And automation in that moment, they brought us to what we nowadays call like ultra fast or hyper connected network for exchanging information in finance, right? So let's think about high frequency trading and so forth and so forth. It can be like, you cannot even think that you can beat a machine in this. Uh, now I think we live in a totally different world, right? And uh, the thing is that very soon uh, we will have a new wave of automation and basically we are not talking about uh, make, taking the decision following rules, but we are talking about making decision, making judgment calls, right? So call machines, they, they will uh, like focus many for, for, I mean, artificial intelligence and we need a change in the industry because as we had infrastructure before, we need a new infrastructure now. Awesome, thank you, Giacomo. So let's dive in. I think there's a lot of, you know, there's financial services and there's also transportation and mobility. Effie, tell you, you, you touched upon this earlier in your introduction, in the opening comments, but how is the financial industry getting disrupted or disaggregated with the advent of technology like automation and AI? Give us an, uh, a worldview of that. I'd like to link to what James uh, referred to earlier. He, he spoke about the fact that we have these narrow, very narrowly focused areas in financial services where we are using AI and other um, uh, such cognitive technologies to improve processes, um, cyber risk, um, know your customer are, are good classic examples where um, uh, you know AI is being used and, and, and the market there is, is mature. So I like to say that there are segregated areas where AI is being used um, and, and there's been a lot of automation where we lack uh, uh, automation is in making these interoperable. So we haven't rebundled, um, if you want, although we've been rebundling uh, fintech services, we haven't rebundled these automations and gone to the, the next level where we're using uh, artificial intelligence to, to intelligently connect them. 
so, so that's where I see uh, the industry. And I think that it's very important to look at our industry in financial services and acknowledge that we've moved from a transaction-oriented uh, service industry to a very contextual uh, industry. So that it needs AI to personalize and customize services and, and serve the customer better. So that's where AI is, is really powerful. We can't hear you. Yeah, I was on mute this time. So thank you, Effie. No, thank you for sharing that. You know, it's interesting, you know, financial services is an industry where if you think about it, most of the products and offerings are virtual, right? It's very much, it's not, there's no physical products. You're not having a supply chain to deal with. You're not actually building or manufacturing anything. It is virtual that is based on trust and equate, you know, relationships and so forth. So from that perspective, financial services provides probably the best opportunity to apply technologies like AI and automation, right? Because you have such an asset light model to deal with, of course, you have balance sheet assets for, you know, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, regulatory reasons, but it is a very asset light model in general, which is also you touched upon earlier, early on how new fintechs are being born outside of financial institutions. Anybody could be a fintech. I, I recently um, invested in a company which they were building an e-commerce bank, right, out of Europe, where with just a Visa debit card for the actual customers. Right and uh, for e-commerce to to access a line of credit with no banking experience, they didn't even they weren't even registered as a bank. They don't have to be if you just to pass through as a visa entity, if you will. So it's fascinating. But you touched upon something else that I want to dive deep with James here, right? Which is the words around. There's a lot of words being thrown around. There's automation. There's robotic process automation. There's intelligent decision making to full autonomy, right? Where is that spectrum? What is intelligent automation? How is that distinct from AI? And how is that related to regular automation or RPA? So yeah, that's a really good question. So in the same way that AI has become this huge umbrella term that means different things to other people, I think intelligent automation has become the banner term for combining you know, traditional process automation, including robotic process automation, RPA, into higher levels of cognitive automation. Uh, we have to remember that the term AI is pretty unhelpful, actually, and tends to represent technologies that, quite frankly, haven't quite proven themselves. Because once something works, it tends to get its own unique name. And intelligent automation, I think, is the label for what's become this high level of automation that's focused on, on automation and application of judgment, rather distinct from machine learning and analysis and the creation of statistical predictions. So you know, typically incorporating processes that you know maybe this first generation of white collar automation technology like RPA cannot touch by applying technologies that, that, that are new on top of that. That is awesome. No, it's actually um, interesting you you say uh, AI has become an umbrella term. In fact, I think the good and the bad news, AI is an artificial intelligence being an umbrella term. 90% of all the work that happens in organizations today is just glorified statistical processing, right? So it's just statistical analytics with a little bit of learning and then some feedback loop to go do that, which is great because it has popularized the field and the space, but the biggest opportunities in the world exist in dealing with unstructured data, dealing with actual business processes and then making them, optimizing them for better cognitive decision-making. So thank you for sharing that perspective. Eric, um, you know, what keeps you from, you know, when you think about automation, especially in your industry too, right? What keeps you from automating everything all the way, right? Like, so rails, tra trains, why can't it just be completely automated today? So one, one reason is because we don't have the same luxury maybe as Epi, we are asset heavy, right? We, uh, that, that makes a big difference. So you, uh, one difficulty is to understand, first of all, what parts can you automate? And then when you want to automate them, you actually have to understand um, what is being done today in, in manual labor. So one big challenge that we have is because we're a traditional company where the processes have evolved over a long time and they were never built for automated or for digital, even there, I mean, digitalization is still catching up in our industry. 
So it's very hard to identify where you can do automation. So today, I think the focus should really lie on automating the parts um, where you can to show that this improves actually your industry overall, so that then in the long run, you can start bringing more and more automation into your processes. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Now, Giacomo, parlay that for financial services, right? What are some of the uh, necessary prerequisites for making sure that you can automate or use apply AI for, let's say, um, uh, investment management, asset management and investment company, right? What are some of the prerequisites you need to have so that you can start thinking about it? Thank you, Ganesh, for giving me the opportunity. It's very, very interesting question because this I was dealing with uh, while I, I mean, before I was in academia and now I joined the, you know, the financial world. Um, uh, what I'm struggling with is trying to convince like uh, managers in the bank and uh, also in the financial world in general that basically it, there is a common like a, a myth that uh, is a misconception actually that that basically the, the idea of hiring uh, a brilliant scientist who's going to find a magic formula to give return. But actually, this is not the case. Otherwise, if we think the most brilliant scientists in the world, they were always, I mean, all of them, they were billionaires, right? I mean, but uh, the, what, what I think instead is that uh, you need the scientific method, right? So basically, you need to build a team and they taking care of the data, the observation, they are making hypotheses, the strategy, right? And, and they test them like an experiment. So they use back testing, uh, cross validation back testing, combinatorial back testing. So basically, you need teams that they implement what in, in academia is called the scientific method. So you have the observation, you have the hypothesis, and you have a theory, and you try to test the theory. So, and this is a consistent way of operating also in artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence is not a brilliant scientist coming in with a magic formula. And uh, this is what I, I want to point out. So you need an investment, of course, to build a team at the beginning, but at the same time, this will be rewarding in the long term. Otherwise, hiring a one only scientist is going to be very dangerous also. Absolutely. I agree. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, it's funny you, you, you mentioned as I was talking to um, the chief digital officer for UBS Asset Management and my stories in AI podcast. And he called out this thing where, you know, idea generation is a great opportunity to actually use artificial intelligence, statistical modeling, to just, hey, do we have some alpha generating ideas here? But there's a big difference between experimentation and putting this and giving this in the hands of the salespeople or the actual relationship managers who talk to high net worth individuals and convince them, hey, here's a great idea. Why? Because my algorithm said so. That doesn't fly very well there, right? So it's a whole different uh, uh, ball game when it comes to deploying cognitive automation at scale in a financial services institution, right? Uh, and it's more than just science. It's, it's, it's a lot more art uh, associated with it. Um, but Ganesh, let, let ahead, me David. add something uh, to, to what's been discussed because I think a, a concrete example in financial services uh, that is uh, virtual uh, by, by its nature will show where things can work and have worked very well um, in, in using AI and, and creating actually new business models. And this the example is in, in the lending business. So uh, one, one of the Chinese uh, fintechs, uh, MyBank, uh, has a model that says 310. So it refers to the fact that you can uh, file a, a loan application in three minutes. You will get approval or disapproval in one minute and zero human intervention. That is AI in practice at scale. So, so this is something that a traditional financial institution that is not using algorithms cannot do because you know all the, the paperwork and the procedures and so on. So we've automated here with algorithms that process 310, and we could, could do that in many other uh, areas, uh, but not across the board, and it cannot be panacea. Uh, that is that's a great example, Effie. And I think uh, it, it's it's fascinating, right? There's a, there's a thread there that says if decisions are already being made 
through formulas and systems and math, it's probably a good candidate to actually do automate you know, decision-making through machine learning. Now that said, you've got to really be careful because it depends on the industry, the actual business process and so forth. Let me ask James the flip of this question, which is what could go wrong? What, what, what's wrong with using machine learning to automate some of these decisions? Yeah, so I think what's interesting is uh, it, it's very easy to interchange the terms machine learning and AI, right? So when you look at a, so if you're, if you're building an automation system that's uh, making credit decisions, uh, you know, regulators have a lot to say about your ability to use statistical uh, machine learn algorithms that are difficult to interpret in areas like credit decision. It causes all sorts of challenges. But of course, when we think about rules-based AI, we always think about these linear decision tree type engines. And actually there is now a space for non-linear rules engines that are able to integrate nuggets of wisdom, human expertise into potentially machine learn algorithms or even without any machine learning that are still highly, highly effective. So, you know, I think we've got these new decision engines that are capable of building these holistic models that are reusable, which is, I think this is the point that Effie was making earlier on, that can lead to all sorts of new business models and products and services um, where you've got this huge power of customization down to building a financial service product for one person actually becomes now economically viable. But it has to be based on bringing interpretability and transparency and trust because the acceleration of the regulation, the regulator's attention onto how these technologies are used is only heading in one direction, okay? There's gonna be more and more regulation and more scrutiny. So we have to balance these different technologies. It's been long since proven that, you know, an algorithm can outperform a human pretty much at any narrow task. It's a question of applying the right technologies in the right way but not always assuming that this is about machine learning. Sometimes it's about other forms of AI. Machine learning is AI, but not all AI is machine learning. So true, so true. And in fact, you're, you're so right. I like to caveat that statement saying, you know, almost any task that humans do can be better automated by uh, through machines and algorithms because you remove a lot of bias and all those things to go make those decisions, provided you can teach the algorithm how to do it. Therein lies the problem, right? You know, it's just not, pushing data and training the algorithm. It's understanding different parts of that business process in itself and then uh, training those parts itself. So Eric, you know, in transportation, your thing, what, what do you think is the greatest potential? What, what areas, what processes for, for automated decision-making, right? Especially can trains run on time, like completely automated? I mean, give us, give us your view on that. A very good uh, point and question. I mean, Yes, they can run very well on time uh, when automated. Germany and uh, especially also Japan has showed that that worked very well. And I think what we see, and also I think I like what James said also that you um, uh, you have this uh, modern decision engine that kind of explain or explainable AI that explain what they do. In our case, what we do is more co-working between AI, machine learning, or automation with humans. But we have realized that we will be able to automate away a few decisions, like simple, quick decisions, like take uh, traffic management, for example. So we have trains in Switzerland running with 90 seconds intervals in between each other. So imagine every 90 seconds there's a train. So if one person puts their uh, foot in the door, right, you get delayed by 15, 30, 60 seconds. That's going to be a huge problem for the rest of the traffic and all your trains. There we can really leverage the automation that those small split seconds decisions that need to be made to get traffic back on track that can be done by machines but then imagine larger decisions there's still going to be a human in the loop like uh, train fails it derails no automated process is going to solve that right but humans are very well in doing that so what we see the potential is going to be automating those simple tasks that are mostly boring for humans and that machines can do with higher precision and higher speed and uh, much more reliable uh, and keep the co-working on the level where humans do the more critical thinking, the more um, complex tasks, but always with aid of some automated processes. No, oh, that's awesome. And I've been thinking through this conversation on, is there a framework here for you know, uh, organizations and businesses to start looking at, here's, a pro here's what I would put the inputs in to decide whether a process is can be automated completely through with machine learning or automation or RPA, 
or should that always be a combination of the two, right? And you know, some some themes are definitely emerging, and I'll I'll, I'll summarize that. But before that, I also see that one of the common themes that all of you seem to agree is the fact that AI, and I wrote about this, like I want to say six, seven years ago, where AI should actually be, should have been called augmented intelligence than artificial intelligence, right? Because the real true power of this is to uh, explore further the human potential by automating the mundane tasks and leaving humans to do what they do best, which is contextual decision making, quali quantitative decisions and so forth, right? Qualitative decisions and so forth. So, but the framework that is emerging from, you know, this conversation I see is there's three inputs, three categories you can look at. One is, is the decision being made, uh, does it have quantitative inputs instead of qualitative inputs, right? Trains run on time. Do they have input for number of trains on the track, the distance between different things, number of tracks, crossovers, all those kind of things. Or financial services decision like asset management, like how many features go into predicting a stock price and so forth. Uh, the number two is the second part of the uh, framework, and I'm making this up based on this conversation, right? So this is a, this is a draft 009, the, is the human interaction as aspect of that decision, right? Is there a lot of human involvement? Do I do human needs to be involved, whether it's dealing with a customer, you know, arbitraging, arbitraging different decisions, so forth, right? And number three, what is the cost of the exception, right? If something goes wrong in an automated system versus not, it's one thing to look at a picture and say it's a cat or a dog, totally different thing to actually let the train run at full speed at 300 you know, uh, miles per hour, and then it hits an oncoming train face off. And like the, the, the decision consequences are too huge to actually be left to only machines, right? So um, there's just some, some thoughts and uh, based on this conversation, taking this a level into the industry and what it means to everybody in the society and humans and so forth, right? Giacomo, tell us, you know, when you increasingly become, and like based on this framework, most of investment decisions are very qualitative, or very quantitative, if you will. Um, you have human interaction, but that is being changed pretty dramatically with Robin Hood and everything. Um, and do you see a role for human investors in the investment management, asset management space in the future? Or is it always going to be, you know, is it going to increasingly go towards automated investing? No, I definitely believe that there's going to be a partnership between the machines and the investors. It's not going to be machine alone, of course. And um, we see this in, in two main, uh, let's say, area of the machine learning, in my opinion. One is the learning process, and the other one is the, the interaction with the machine in taking the decision. Um, in the first respect, I would like to highlight that machine learning is a fantastic tool, but it can be very dangerous, right? Um, so basically, in specifically in finance, we are coming from econometrics, which is basically is a multivariate Gaussian, right? It's a normal distribution and uh, is a linear regression. That's uh, econometrics. Instead with machine learning, we can do much more. We can also go from a flat space to a curved space. But this flexibility makes artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, to comply with what uh, James was saying before, uh, very dangerous, right? Because it's so flexible that the machine can learn by heart what we are teaching, right? Uh, which is, in technically speaking, is the overfitting, but for the people that they are not technical, it's uh, that the machine is learning by heart. And if you learn by heart, the mathematical problem you will not solve, you will not pass the exam of school, right? The machine has to learn how to solve the problem, not learning it by heart. Um, and uh, and the, another thing is, in my opinion, the collaboration with humans, um, recently, I developed a technique based, uh, I mean, I put on top of machine learning technique Bayesian statistics, right? I mean, Bayesian is uh, uh, the way to go, the mathematical framework to introduce uncertainty into our model. Uh, because in finance, of course, we have risk. Without risk, there is no gain. But we also have uncertainty. And uh, if we treat uncertainty in our problem, we can also solve the problem that you were talking about, Ganesh, about the transportation and automation, uh, because in the sensors of the machine, we need to detect whether it's a cat or is a dog. And we need also, the, uh, we need to measure to assess also the uncertainty of this prediction. And Bayesian statistics is the way to go. With Bayesian statistics, you also, in the case of investment, you can input also the view of the 
the investors, right? And so there is a, a partnership between the machine and humans. Awesome. No, thank you. No, I, you know, I, in fact, I, I like Bayesian as a way of thinking in general too, right? Which is allowing you to actually a account for the uncertainty and incoming new data points when you're making any decisions, right? And you're recalibrating your decision based on new input, which is the essence of Bayesian thinking. Uh, so thanks for uh, diving in a little deeper here. Um, no, one thing that is also emerging here is it's not just, um, you know, let's just go make a decision and make a choice between an automated decision versus uh, an AI informed or AI uh, augmented decision that a human makes based on things. But the one thing that is actually emerging is governance, right, of AI. And how does that really play out in the scenario, right? Because there's a big difference between the human, you know, like Effie was giving the example of the lending example where it was earlier, there was a human being who was actually making a lending decision you can really look back and say, if there was a bias in the way that decision was made, it was made by a human being, there's corrective action that can be actually put in place, but now you're looking at um, an algorithm automating that decision, right? So role of governance, role of you know ethical implementation of these solutions, what are your thoughts on that, Effie? How do you see that play out uh, in your conversations? Well, first of all, in the example, which is a, a good one to use of, of uh, you know, credit and, and uh, learning, um, it is clear that there is a need of adaptive uh, learning to, and, and, and reviewing uh, uh, how good the, the credit decisions were, where uh, there were uh, biases or, or errors, uh, and, and how risk management can be used there. So it, that is definitely needed. Uh, it's, we're not talking about a rule-based AI, we're talking about um, in some cases, machine learning is used for the credit decision, and in other cases, it's really alternative data and, and using uh, rule-based. Uh, the, the ethical issues are there in financial services, 100%. Um, we have, uh, unfortunately, examples with, uh, let's say, the, the credit card that Apple issued uh, through Goldman Sachs, uh, and, and uh, it was clear that uh, there was a bias um, disfavoring women. There were examples of couples that filed for the credit card and the woman was declined and, and the man was accepted. So, you know, you see there that something went wrong with the algorithm. So we have a lot to, to learn. What is very good and important, we're at a stage where the industry is sensitive to these issues. So you can't hide for too long and um, that the issues are going to be addressed. Can't hear you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Effie. James, did you want to add something there? I know you were nodding when, when I was asking that question. You know, I, I, I think, you know, what, what, what's really of interest to, to, to me and, and those that are trying to bring these tools to business people to be more uh, to, to solve the knowledge elicitation problem of getting the expertise out of people's heads and ensuring that that is part of these models is, is, is just being able to drive business interfaces that, that enable us to democratize these tools so they come out of the AI lab into the hands of more business people and the need to just effectively drive technologies that can deliver you know, a plain English explanation or in any language for that matter behind each and every individual decision, even where statistical machine learned methods are part of that equation. I think, you know, we, we've, history's told us we're right not to trust technologies that we don't understand. Uh, and so that ability to interpret on a case by case basis, how, why I can or cannot get credit is absolutely key and democratizing the way we build these tools. That is awesome. That's awesome. Eric, any, any thoughts on, um, from, from your vantage point? Yes, I had some thought, uh, thoughts on your 0.99 model of uh, how to implement automation very well. Uh, this goes directly in, in what we are actually implementing currently. And I think that is one important learning I've had in the last few years using AI and automation is 
uh, really work together with their user experience team, be it users that are your customers or users that use your technology within the automation uh, to really understand um, what are they actually doing, what's their process and how can we help it with automation? And then also in what parts is AI helping and where is it not helping? So to really get this partnership going between machines and humans to go forward. So data science and user experience are very good partners in building great automation solutions. That is awesome. It's all about the human machine partnership. And I like to think that I'm dedicating my life to actually go solving that. We're really out of time. So I'm going to ask a quick round of, uh, uh, you know, a rapid fire question for everybody. You get 30 to 45 seconds each. And I'll start with you, Giacomo. What is your advice to the audience here? If they're looking at their businesses, their constituents, their, you know, clients, to give them advice for how should they look at applying AI across the spectrum of automation through autonomy. So since we have a very uh, little time, I would like actually to advertise my point of view because this is also my dream that I try to pursue because it's time for science and uh, uh, we need to bridge the gap between academia and, um, and the industry. And we are there and these are really exciting time because uh, Artificial intelligence is a very interdisciplinary topic. And uh, in my opinion, we need to collaborate. It's not just a matter of being a data scientist, a physicist or mathematician. It's also collaborating with a lot of expertise. And uh, I found it like very exciting, especially uh, when I was working in finance, I was working with a, a colleague of mine and also friends uh, who is a chief investment officer from whom I learned a lot. And uh, without him, of course, and the advice from the financial expertise, with artificial intelligence, you cannot do anything. So for me, it's again, a partnership between humans and the machines, and also a lot of interdisciplinarity and a lot of learning curve for everybody. Awesome. Effie, I'll go to you next. I would like to um, share some um advice, uh, especially for financial services businesses that are not uh, native data businesses or native cloud businesses. Um, my advice is that they need to start at the foundational level, looking at a data strategy and then uh, um, thinking what are the business outcomes that they want and then talking to the AI tech people about how to, to get there. So first the foundation uh, at, the, at the data layer. Awesome. Uh, Eric. Um, yeah, thanks Epi. I can just add on that. I really liked everything you just said. I would just also add to start with something simple. And then as you learn on the go, success will come. So really start with simple tasks and then move on from there. And as you learn, you will improve. But you need the foundation, like Effie said. That's awesome. James? I think my advice would be that, you know, sometimes even if you're not data ready, that doesn't mean that you can't get started in the automation space. I actually think the attributes of a successful intelligent automation project are the same as any technology technology initiative. It's actually, they're all quite human attributes. You need a very clear idea about what it is you're trying to achieve. You need senior buy-in. You need an open and positive culture for change. You need to start small and build up. So and I'd agree with everything that the rest of the panel have said, but also recognize it's not always about starting with data. You can start with uh, a clear business problem. And even if you're not data ready, you can make some massive waves forward. Thank you, thank you, James. And I, I'd like to close out by saying, look, AI, artificial intelligence is a once in a lifetime opportunity for all of us. This is a transformational piece of technology that will fundamentally rewrite the world as we know, right? And, and along with some of the other frontier technologies like crypto. And you know, they, uh, a mentor used to tell me a long time ago when I started in this space, this like, it's an opportunity for you as a company to accelerate, you know, uh, uh, you know, really far ahead of your competition or be left behind very quickly because things change very fast. So the earlier you start, the better for you, you're going to have compounding gains of actually doing it. And lastly, I would just say, right, you know, uh, think big, think about solving the big problems, focus on the problem than the technology, but start small and move fast. And that's the way you win in the space. 
I am so grateful for all of you to spending the time. Effie, James, Eric, and Giacomo, thank you so much for sharing your insights. It was such an amazing panel. I learned a lot, and I'm sure the audience did too. Over to you, Dalit. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Wow. That was you. really great. And I must say, I've learned a lot again. And I'm getting really nervous sometimes. I think I would so much like to discuss with you in a panel. And I'm standing here thinking like, this is such so cool. Thanks a lot from our side. It was great listening to your insights, brainstorm. And I would like to just say one thing again. I'm not sure whether everyone really realized what Eric said about our Swiss railway. I mean, being Swiss, knowing Eric for a long time, we know quite well what they, these guys are doing. If you just think about what that means, having 90 seconds interval, and as he explained what happened if someone just you know stands in the door waiting his friends or her is uh, uh, coming in, what that means. And these are definitely things we just can't solve with technology, especially with AI. And saying that, Eric, I'm very sorry, but I just have to say that I would really love to have you well known stage to explain us real use cases that you are focusing on because we know that, and the story for that, Swiss Railway is definitely one of the best worldwide. And I think a lot of industry can learn from these use cases, adapt <laughs> to them. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, I just had to say that because I think they're just doing an enormous, great job and we should learn from each other. So thanks again for all of you, Ganesh, again, for your passionate way Thank to you. moderate and engage your panelists. Just fantastic. Thank you, Effie James, Eric and Giacomo for enriching this event with your views. Thank Next you. on the agenda. You, bye. bye, guys. Next on the agenda we will deep dive into the biggest misunderstanding in AI, presented by Kane. Kane, you are a Harvard Business Review published thought leader in the voice AI industry. You are ranking amongst the world's top AI voice influences, and with your podcast, you have educated over 100,000 people. With your consultancy, VUX World, you work with global brands to define an executive, execute strategy centered on voice. I'm so sorry, I'm getting a tired tongue. Give me another <laughs> chance. It's been a long day. I've been tuning in. It's been a hell of a lot going on. <laughs> and it's still me and not an avatar. Hey, guys and girls out there, it's definitely still me. I'm not going to do it with an avatar. Well, it could be in the future. So you... You are doing conversational and NLP technologies. Thanks a lot for being with you, uh, with us. <laughs> it's like time is over. Thanks for being with <laughs> us, and especially to have this grande finale. The virtual stage is yours. Uh, I have a few slides, uh, but I'll, I'll, I've got them all behind the scenes anyway, whoever was in my ear. So yeah, yeah, it's all good. We're all, all ready to rumble. I appreciate that, Dalith. Uh, yeah, I've been tuning in, in and out throughout the afternoon, and I know that you've been there solidly uh, pushing through it. So I can't believe that you're actually uh, still standing, to be honest, because I know that I've done a few of these in the past, and it is very tiring. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, you know, it's so fascinating listening to all of you. This is what gives me energy. Good, good. That sounds good. That sounds good. Well, it's been a fantastic day and I'm absolutely honoured uh, for you to have me along uh, to wrap it up. I'm hoping that there's some value in this for the people tuning in, for those that are, that are, that are watching. And uh, yeah, let me know if you, if, how you want to kind of play this, really. I can just crack, crack on now if we're, if we're happy. Just go on. The stage is yeah. yours. Okay. Nice one. Thank you very much. OK, uh, yeah, well, thank you for that. And uh, thank you for everyone who's tuning in. Um, I'm sure you've had, I mean, as, as I said, I've been dipping in and out throughout the day and it's been absolutely amazing uh, all day long. And uh, I'm absolutely delighted to join you. So what I thought I would start with this, I mean, this is probably a rhetorical question, actually, given um, the, pe the kind of people and the kind of person that you are tuning into an event like this, you are obviously interested at least in AI if you're not already working in the AI profession. And what I've been thinking a lot lately about is what business won't be affected by AI at some point in the next 
five years. So think about your business, think about your company, either the role that you do or broader the products and services that you have. Do you think that AI in some way, shape or form will have some kind of impact, no matter how moderate, on your business in the next five years? You know, from a customer experience perspective, from an operational perspective, and chances are the answer is likely to be yes. Fair enough, we're probably slanted in terms of our uh, audience here because you're inevitably you're further along in that journey than some others, given that you're turning up to events like this. But most organizations are going to be affected by AI. And what I've observed over the last four years of running VUX World is that many, many organizations almost have this like fear uh, that, that holds them into this state of inaction because they think and feel as though the task in front of them is just too vast there's technology is changing all the time it's the 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 world is moving at a rapid pace technology is moving at such an advanced rate they've already got most businesses have already got more than enough stuff to do all of a sudden there's this promise of ai there's the promise of these kind of like uh, you know autonomous conversations autonomous processes and the whole world just seems to be a little bit of a mission and so uh, there is a there is a reference here that the Matterhorn, uh, it, it's, it feels often for organizations like they've got a lot to do and a big mountain to climb. Either they think that the AI in general is very complex, you know, they, they feel and think as though they need machine learning engineers or data scientists and a whole bunch of people and capabilities and resources that they don't currently have. They think it might take them an absolute age in order to do either that or they actually don't have the time because business is busy anyway. Everybody's got jobs to do and you're already working or overworked arguably in terms of the work that you're doing right now. And how expensive is it? I think there's a huge uh, perception that AI, given the kind of like bleeding edge nature of it, is incredibly expensive to implement. And so what ends up happening is most organizations find this kind of technology a challenge because most cultures in most organizations are used to having, you know, detailed roadmaps planned out for, you know, months, years in advance. And the reality is that when you're working with uh, emerging technologies, this is a framework that you might have seen from the agile um, methodology, some of the agile methodologies, you can use it to determine whether you should take an agile approach to your projects or programs. And what you'll find is that when you don't have, so top here is uncertainty, when you don't have certainty around your requirements, and if you don't have certainty around your technology, you end up in this complex area. And that's where most AI projects fall. If you're down here, or down there rather, and you understand your requirements and you understand your technology, then you can have that longer, st longer term vision, more detailed planning, have all your ducks in a row, define all your requirements, get all your budgets signed off for the next 12 months and start working through a program. A little bit like climbing the actual mountain, if you were gonna climb a mountain today, you would be able to understand what equipment you need, what route you're going to take up, what people you need to take with you, and a whole bunch of stuff will be planned out. But AI isn't like climbing a mountain because a lot of this stuff hasn't been done before or it's only been done very early. And so instead, what I profess and what I uh, coach and that we consult is to try and understand and get people to think about just getting to this point. So if you're here now and you're starting your journey here, wherever you are, the next thing you should be thinking is how do we get to this next checkpoint? Three, six, possibly 12 months, but it doesn't even need to be any longer than six months down the line. How can we get to this next checkpoint and what is that next checkpoint going to be? And so this is really the 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 uh, progress and, and, and the, the steps that, that we advise taking. Now, Dalith mentioned at the beginning that we specialize in conversational AI and all of these various channels, which is almost every single touch point for a business, has a conversational interface or conversational capabilities, should we say. Businesses fundamentally are just a series of transactions, a series of exchanges, and those exchanges are becoming more and more natural language based. Conversational AI is essentially just um, a, a way of having automated conversations with machines. You could think of it as, you know, the you might be familiar with down here, like Alexa, Google Assistant. You know, you've got automated messaging on social or SMS. Uh, you know, in, in, independent voice assistants. A lot of companies like Mercedes and uh, Bank of America are creating their own independent voice assistants. Even down to uh, humans, avatars, enterprise uh, and apps like Slack and Teams. and all, Every single thing that we do uh, every day, most of the systems we touch, most of the touch points we have with customers have are conversational in nature. And so it's our belief at VOX World that the front end for businesses in future, in the next five to 10 years, the front touch point for most customers and most organizations will be an AI, and the front end for most AI systems will actually be a conversational interface. And so this is the way that we approach things. 
Now, I mentioned that most organizations want to have things lined up 12 months, three years down the line plan ahead as much as they can in as much details as they can to, to uh, reduce the perceived perception of risk that they have um, and to try and get basically they kind of want to see the picture of the top of the mountain before they make the climb um, but with AI we mentioned that the requirements are uncertain the technology is uncertain and so what can we do to take a step forward how can we reach that checkpoint and we've developed a methodology that will have you do that in just five days which I'll walk you through. So uh, the example I'm using is from Maidstone Council so they came to us um, really with four fundamental questions so is there a business is there any business value in us using ai technologies for our organization uh, what's actually possible with with ai technologies in general and once we understand that where do we start and then how can we be sure that what we're doing is actually going to meet our needs and going to take us in the right direction i don't think that that is any dis it's not dissimilar to most of the questions that most organizations when they think about ai have and so you might be familiar with this book from Jake Knapp, uh, the Sprint uh, Design Sprint. So Jake Knapp was an ex-Google, uh, ex-Googler, developed this methodology at Google, and it's become kind of like a standard design practice. We kept, or we well, we kept the framework as in five days, but everything else be pretty much uh, and apart from the framework. We kept the the testing and prototyping, but the rest of the structure we've essentially uh, developed our own methodology around how to define a conversational AI strategy, validate that strategy, and put a plan to the next checkpoint within five days. And this is what it looks like. So on the Monday, we start with goal setting. We're not necessarily needing to define smart objectives at this stage. Really what we're trying to do is we're just trying to take a step forward. So we want to just try and understand what is our description of the view that we would think is going to be at the top of that mountain when we get there. Then we start looking at the channels that we have as a business from our app, to our website, to our call center, to where whatever touch points we have with uh, customers. And we start to define where most of the demand is or where most of the problems are from a customer experience perspective or from an internal business operations perspective. We then, once we understand the, the channel of focus in Maidstone, the call center, we then start to drill down into what use cases within that environment do we think are having the biggest impact on either productivity for staff or uh, inefficiencies for the business process or uh, negative customer experiences. And so we walk through which use cases should we be looking to consider and then we prioritize which use cases we think have some short term value. And then we build a business case and put together a roadmap for that. Here's just some examples of the kind of stuff that, that we did. So here we prioritize. You might be familiar with this matrix if you've ever worked on, on these kind of projects in the past. Um, we What we're trying to find is high volume use cases that have relatively low complexity. So to get us started, to get us moving, we're trying to find use cases like this one here things that we're going to add enough value to the business because they're high volume and things that we can get on with relatively quickly because they're low complexity. And then what we did is we go through all the rest of the use cases that we have and we run it through a matrix and a, and a process that says, what do we think the potential value of these conversations are and how can we automate or, or can we automate them essentially? And so at the end of that process, we arrived for Maidstone Council at this uh, position, which is that we estimate that if all goes to plan, if all goes really, really well, we could potentially be looking at the AI handling of, uh, around about 75% of calls for this one business unit for the set, uh, set use cases that we defined. Then we move into the design phase. So day two is all spent on design. We find that one use case that we want to start with. In this instance, it was reporting missed waste collections. Every single country in the world and every single government organization in the world has this problem of how to take requests from people when, when you miss their recycling collections and stuff like that. And we start by defining the personality. So when you're working with conversational systems, it's a little bit like, think of it like, um, in marketing or branding, when you create your logo and your brand guidelines, what you're trying to do is make sure that the image that you have of the brand and the things that you as a company believe define that brand, you create the design and visual assets to make sure that that uh, personality is communicated consistently in the minds of your millions of customers. The personality design is the exact same principle when it comes to conversational interfaces. It's the personality of the thing, the assistant that is communicating to the user, and whether that is one, in line with the customer needs and the interaction goals, and two, in line with the brand. It helps design teams basically um, be consistent when it comes to creating and designing for conversational applications. We then move into, with that specific use case, in this instance, we were actually listening to calls, live calls in the contact center, about these missed bin requests, call recordings and live calls. And essentially what we're trying to do 
is we're trying to understand customer needs based on the actual live data. There's ways of scaling this. Obviously, there's technologies that exist that will ingest a whole bunch of data and spit out the, these kind of parameters and your, your use cases and intents as they're known. Um, but again, we don't want to go ahead of ourselves. We just want to take a step forward to the next milestone. So doing this manually is fine for the purposes of this. So we define our customer needs, what our customers want, what our customer wants to know. We want to know what they're motivated by, what they worry about, and a whole bunch of other stuff. What kind of they actually speak what kind of phrases do they use really important for training data when it comes to building out your systems and then we want to have a listen to the agents who are answering the phone calls and want to know what they can actually do based on the systems they have access to based on the information that they have what could we tell them already do we have their phone number are they already in the crm do we know something about them and then so what do we not have access to is there any system integrations that we don't have access to for argument's sake and a whole other things and what this does essentially is this defines the parameters and scopes of the conversation we then do a whole bunch of stuff around uh, sample dialogues and role play and we get it together essentially what we think is a straw person diagram of that end-to-end -end conversation and then what we do on the wednesday here is we build a prototype and we aim to test that on the thursday the whole point in building the prototype is to see that on the monday when we define our use cases and we understand what the business case is and the percentage of automation that we're looking to achieve, we can scope the design on the Tuesday. What we want to do on the Wednesday is we want to see whether we can design a conversation that is able to hold successful enough conversations, highly successful conversations, in order to validate the business case. So can we actually get people through that conversation from end to end? Uh, and then we'll test it. And I'll, I'll just give you an example now. Uh, let's see if it works. I'm going to do a live demo. Okay, we have to round up, and so so you won't see the lab demo. So that's a shame. Uh, but essentially, uh, essentially, yeah, we we designed the conversation, we built the conversation, and the next step needed is technology proof of concept. So what we ended up doing is by starting with a single conversation, we're able to just build and validate that strategy uh, for a single conversation. Then we can move one conversation at a time through that department, then the next department, then the next department. The contact center is looking in good shape. Then you can scale that to other channels and other channels. And so the aim of the game isn't to look at this mountain that you have to climb. And that one conversation to start with. And these days, because of the cloud dialogue flow, because of these cloud technologies, they've democratized access to a lot of this AI technology. So you don't have to buy a big system. You can literally just design and launch a single conversation, and you can do that in around about a week was on my phone this morning when I was walking my dog. How is that for chances? Uh, I won't go into the detail of what it is, but I have a look, this is at 10 past eight this morning, and the phrase is building, not building a wall, making a brick. And that's exactly what your AI strategy should be about in the early days. Yes, you will build a wall eventually, but if you can build a single brick, you can build that brick repeatedly over time, in the end, you will have a wall. So don't think about the mountain you've got to climb. Just think about how can you take a step forward. And as we've proven with Maidstone Council and others, you can do that in five days. Thank you. Wow, impressive and very insightful, Kane. And actually, you're also a very fast talker. Mm. Many thanks for sharing your views this, on the. This this presentation Sorry? probably would have took me about 15 minutes, but I was conscious of the guy in my ear saying that we need to move on. So, so yeah, yeah, this is yeah. this is we a rattled, Swiss clock, exactly. This is a Swiss <laughs> clock. But uh, you know, I'm I'm getting into listen faster, so that's also a good improvement. But in any case, it was a great pleasure to listen to the biggest misunderstanding in AI, and. Uh, with that, I must say a great applause to you, Kane, for contributing to our Swiss cognitive community. We are grateful to count you among our fellows. Definitely. With that, it's a pleasure. I've been following it for a long time. So thank you very much for having me. It's thanks a lot. Pleasure. It's an honor to us. And I definitely hope to see you again on our stages and to collaborate more. I think we all can learn a lot from you guys. Okay, thanks. And another three hours of insightful and incredible content just finished. I would like to share some of the takeaways with you, dear audience. We learned about explainability and how this can create transparency and trust in AI, that co-creation and education are key. We learned about the first steps we should take on our automation journey and how we make sure that humans and the planet stay in the portable mode. 
Iron Man in real life told us about the importance of reskilling people into the AI future and how the education process needs to be improved. We heard about challenges companies face when implementing AI solution and steps they should take in order to ensure a successful integration. We heard what skills are going to be more in demand and what work environment is needed to take advantage of the skills, as well as highlighted the importance of AI and data and ethics. We learned how to create high quality content by leveraging AI experts and strategy. Human needs to improve AI and actually not vice versa. We heard different perspectives on the current state of autonomy and automation from the financial industries as well as the transportation and the mobility industry. The last panel highlighted AI's potential to customize the customer's experience, described prerequisites for automation in the financial industry, and highlighted the need for a scientific method to improve IA. What well, AI would be better referred to as augmented or assisted intelligence that is better described its true purpose. There, actually, I would also like to add something. Why actually do we say artificial intelligence? It doesn't somehow make sense. Because when we talk about artificial joints, organs, or plants, we always think it must be kind of as natural, as realistic as possible. But here, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we are not really thinking about rebuilding our brain. So also here, I must say, augmented intelligence is definitely a better word, or as we like to call it, cognitive technologies. Dear friends and AI enthusiasts, it's again time to say goodbye. Time is running so fast, but that's a good sign. The more exciting a topic is, the faster the time goes by. Now, very important, Stay tuned for a Swiss Cognitive Surprise coming on November 15th. And we were thinking about how can we engage with you with our surprise. So look into social media on November 15th. And for the first 100 commenting on our surprise, we're going to involve you on social media and leverage and amplify yourself with a quote. Saying that, thanks again for being with us. Thanks to the whole team of Swiss Cognitive. Without them, we would be never able to do what we did. And especially a great thanks to you, dear audience, for the interaction, using the chat, for your comments. And especially if you have something to share and to say, please reach out to us and see how we can collaborate on stage or on our newsletter, The Roundup, or in social media. The next event and the last one for this year is going to be on the 14th of December. And believe me, we have already a few global AI thought leaders. I never thought that they will come to our stage sharing with our community. Stay tuned. Take care and see you soon. Bye.